We have the Sedgefield Declaration, Tony Blair's Declaration. I, Norman Vaux, being, being the acting returning officer for the Sedgefield constituency, hereby give notice that the total number of votes given for each candidate at the election held on Thursday, 1st May 1997, was as follows. Ronald Walter Alexander Leslie Beadle, Liberal Democrat, 3,050. Anthony Charles Linton Blair, the Labour Party candidate, 33,526. Ladies and gentlemen, can I read the other ones out, please? Brian Gibson, Socialist Labour Party, 474. <laughs> Miriam Hall, the Referendum Party candidate, 1,683. <laughs> Elizabeth Mary Alice Pittman, the Official Conservative Party candidate, 8,383. And, and, and I do hereby declare that Anthony Charles Linton Blair has been duly elected to serve as Member of Parliament for the Sedgefield constituency. Tony Blair kisses his wife and a very safe Labour seat, of course, Sedgefield for him. But after he's congratulated the other candidates, we'll hear the first words that he's spoken tonight. The man who is going to be Prime Minister with the biggest majority that the Labour Party has ever had. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And can I first of all give my sincere thanks to Norman, the returning officer, and to all the staff who've worked here so magnificently this evening and given us such a, a quick count. Many, many thanks indeed to you all. Can I also thank the police for their work in uh, doing this in a slightly unusual set of circumstances this evening. And I think as ever, they've been absolutely wonderful for us and I should like to thank them very much. In addition, I should thank to all the staff here at the Leisure Centre who have done a wonderful job. All of you have helped to make this count work extremely smoothly. Many thanks indeed. Can I also uh, take this opportunity too of thanking uh, the other candidates in the election. I'm sorry they haven't seen quite as much of the, me as they perhaps would have liked, um, or perhaps not. Um, but if I may just say, I, I know that it's been a very clean, a very good campaign. And if I can say this to um, Lizzie, who came second and who is the Conservative candidate, I once fought a very uh, hopeless Conservative seat in Beaconsfield in the south of England. And look what happened to me. Um, so, you, you never can tell. Um, I would also, if I may, here, pay a special word of thanks to those people that have returned me as the Member of Parliament for Sedgefield for these last 14 years. You have been absolutely magnificent to me all the way through. You've given me loyal support, you've given me encouragement, you've stood by me through each and every one of the difficult times. And the greatest pleasure that I have is to serve you with all my heart and with all my energy. So thank you to all those people that have supported me and to the good people of the Sedgefield constituency. Thank you. Perhaps you will allow me too to say a word of thanks in particular to my family that is here this evening, to Cherie, who has been such a wonderful source of strength to me all the way through the last few weeks, indeed all through my political life, and all my family who are here. If I could say a special word of welcome to my father, who came and was with me when I was first elected to the Sedgefield constituency in 1983 and who has just been magnificent to me all my life, and I would never, ever have done what I've done without him. And if I'm...
I know that for him, like me, all that could have made this moment complete was that my mother was here as well. But I would like to thank, too, all Cherie's family for their strength and support, and of course, all my good and loyal party workers, not least my agent, John Burton, who is a star in his own right. If I can just say this to you all, it is an honor to serve you. And I feel this evening a deep sense of honor, a deep sense of responsibility, and a deep sense of humility. You have put your trust in me, and I intend to repay that trust. I will not let you down. And when I think back over the last 14 years that I've been the Member of Parliament for this constituency, it's an area that's undergone the most dramatic and extraordinary change. And all through those difficult changes, there has been a spirit in this constituency and in the communities surrounding it. And that spirit has been the spirit of unity, of determination to take on the challenge of change and overcome it, and work for the good of all the people of this constituency. And that is actually the spirit that our country needs now. Because if we have been as successful as the indications are that we have been, and you know me all the way through, I've been against complacency, and I'm still against it until those results finally come through. But if we have done well, then I know what this is a vote for. It is a vote for the future. It is not a vote for outdated dogma or ideology of any kind. It is a vote for an end to divisions, an end to looking backwards, a desire to apply the basic, decent British values of common sense and imagination to the problems we all know we face as a country today. And it is with a real sense of pride that we have created a Labour Party today capable of offering that unity of purpose that vision of renewal that our country needs. So that with those decent values in place, we can tackle the problems that our country faces. In our schools, in our hospitals, on the crime in our streets, the jobs for our young people, the industries of the future, the very basic things that determine whether a country succeeds or fails. We are a great country. The British people are a great people. There is no greater honor than to serve them, and serve them we will. Thank you. Tony Blair there, having won his safe seat in Sedgefield, thanking his family, thanking the constituency that supported him all these years, and for the first time speaking about the Labour Party as he sees it, now that he acknowledges that he is going to be Prime Minister, cautious as he said he always is. Well, Peter, we've had the first Conservative win of the night in. <laughs> so far, 17 losses and one seat taken with 69 declared. What's the story? The Tories will have some seats. Just look at the measure of what Tony Blair has achieved. This is the map of Britain that we've had for the past five years. That's the election the Tories won last time. Look how Mr Blair has changed the pattern of colour in the country. It's an astonishing achievement. Look at all the red patches coming on. We've never seen anything like this under Labour. Look at the score. Labour have never had more than 400 seats. 142 gains. The Tories down to 157. They're lowest for a very, very long time. The Liberal Democrats, too, a triumph for them. They've never been up that high since the 1930s. Look at the gains now flashing away, how the colour of the country has been transformed. Liberal Democrats massively back here, Labour back in the home counties in the Midlands, much more than any of them can ever have expected. And so Mr Blair, with a record majority, with a record high number of Labour votes, is into number 10 Downing Street with a huge majority of something like 170, with uh, another record to his name as well. Here is the youngest Prime Minister ever, William Pitt, 1783, he was aged 24. Here is the youngest Prime Minister to date after William Pitt, 
and it is no other than the Lord Liverpool, who was in 1812, 42, when he became Prime Minister. You now have to jump 185 years to find Tony Blair next to the records with age 43. Tony Blair, age 43, only a year behind a man who succeeded in the day when they did become Prime Minister very young, back in 1812. David. Huge swings have defeated David Hunt, the former cabinet minister, in Wirral West. 14% swing, and Stephen Hesford takes that. Wirral South, Labour win that. Don Chapman with a swing of 15% after a by-election. Birmingham Hall Green, Labour gain, the Conservatives defeated there on a swing of 14%. Oldham East and Saddleworth, this was the one that Chris Davies, the Liberal Democrat, took at the by-election. Labour have jumped from third to first place. And Paul Woolas takes that seat. Phil Woolas. Vale of Cluid, a Labour gain. Chris Ruane takes that, a swing of 14% again, these vast swings. And the Liberal Democrat gain in Portsmouth South that we saw happening, Mike Hancock taking the seat with a majority of 4,300. And another Liberal Democrat gain in Hazel Grove, Brendan Murphy the Conservative defeated and a huge 11,000 majority from just under 1,000 for the Tories last time round in the southeast of Manchester, where Sir Tom Arnold used to sit. And Labour gain in North Avon, Sir John Cope, Liberal Democrat gain here, Sir John Cope defeated, majority 2,000. It was a fairly safe seat, they thought, in the northeast side of Bristol, which may make some problems for William Waldgrave, whose uh, seat we haven't yet had. Now let's join Jeremy Paxman again. Jeremy. Thank you, David. Cecil Parkinson, this is about as bad as it can get, isn't it? Well... Uh... I'm very pleased we won a seat. I was beginning to wonder. <laughs> I, I was actually beginning to think uh, that John Major would remain the leader of the party and the only member of um, the only member we had in the House of Commons at one stage. But uh, clearly, these are the seats in the smaller city areas. The country seats will declare later. But it's a very, very bad night for I've us. I've got some terribly good news for you. Apparently, it's a second Tory victory just been and That's announced. relieved. So we are going to have a rival for the leadership if, uh, if it carries on like this. <laughs> Neil Kinnock, um, when you saw Tony Blair's acceptance speech there in his constituency, was it just a little bit of you that thought that could have been me? It would be unnatural and almost inhuman not to occasionally uh, feel that, but I must say, you saw Tony Blair there at his relaxed best, speaking to his own people, but translating <laughs> what he felt about Sedgefield over these years in national terms. And I think that that's why he is a quite an outstanding character and fully deserves to win. I'm overjoyed for him. By comparison with 92, you couldn't get a starker contrast of emotions, presumably tonight and then. No, uh, then it was a time of mourning. And I think that uh, Labour supporters did feel as if they'd been bereaved. That's what they communicated to me. Today is literally a new dawn, and they're going to enjoy it, and rightly so. David Steele, what do you make of the Liberal Democrat results so far? Are they encouraging? It's very encouraging. I'm very sad that um, Liz Lynn and Chris Davis have lost. It's, what seems to be happening, actually, is that the Labour tide is sweeping everything before it, and, and uh, these seats which we held against hot Labour competition, we haven't been able to hang on. But we're picking up more seats from the Conservatives, and there is some evidence, I think Neil and I were just talking about this, that there is a real tactical vote going on. The mm. Liberal Democrat vote is disappearing in favour of Labour in some places, right. and the Labour vote has disappeared in favour of the Liberal Democrats. Well, some. Peter Snow has more on that. Cecil Parkinson, if you... If you we, oh, I think he I thought he was going to tell us what the scale of the landslide <laughs> Tony was. Tony Blair here with Leo, his father, the man who wanted to be a Conservative MP, who had a stroke when he was 42, was a lawyer and was unable to carry on and uh, has now of course become a supporter of New Labour and Tony Blair. Catherine, his daughter, in his arms there and you and Nicky, the two sons, at the count at Sedgefield. And Cherie, who's a distinguished lawyer in her own right and a judge and intends to be back practicing as a judge in one of the smaller courts in a couple of weeks' time. So she says, if she's not taken over by all this. Now we go to Putney, because we're told that Putney may have fallen to Labour.
David Mallow, the Conservative, is rumoured to have been defeated here, and it's also said that Norman Lamont has lost Harrogate. Michael Burke is there at Putney, and uh, one other note, Bristol West is said to be too close to call, William Walgrave's seat. Let's join Michael Burke down at Putney. Michael. David, the declaration is just about to, about to come. We understand that David Mellor has probably lost his seat by around 3,000 votes. And the other interesting point is to James Goldsmith, we think, has lost his deposit. Being the returning officer for the Putney constituency, I hereby give notice that the total number of votes given for each candidate at the election was as follows. Beige, Lenny... Happiness stands freedom to party party, 101. <laughs> Coleman, Tony, Labour Party, 20,084. <laughs> Goldsmith, James, Referendum Party, 1,580. <laughs> Jemison, William, UK Independence Party, 233. Mallor, David, Conservative Party, 17,108. <laughs> Poole, Atika, Independent Beautiful Party, 49. Pine, Russell, Liberal Democrat, 4,739. Small John, Natural Law Party, 66. Van Brahm Dorian, Renaissance Democrat, 7. <laughs> Yardley Michael, Sportsman's Alliance, anything but Mella, 90. <laughs> and that and that Tony Coleman has been duly selected, elected to serve as member for the Putney constituency. So Anthony Coleman for Labour takes that seat, the leader of Merton Council. David Mellor, Heritage Minister, defeated, man who resigned from the Cabinet, defeated. And the uh, this is a great victory Sir James for Goldsmith, Putney. there are cheers there for the defeat for of David Mellor. A new beginning for Putney the second the London Kingdom. seat to come through and the second gain for Labour. And from South London, they're gathering at the Festival Hall to celebrate that. Incidentally, Sir James Goldsmith got 3.5%, lost his deposit. You need 5% not to lose your deposit. And the referendum party doesn't seem to be doing any better as a result of his standing there is it, uh, than it has been in the other places where it's been standing. Anyway. Peter, let's have a look at how things are running now. Well, David, we had a look at the measure of the Labour Party's huge success, record-breaking success. Let's take a measure of the Tories' disastrous failure. Now, we remember we, earlier on we showed a few top personalities in the Tory party standing under a cliff, but it's much worse than that. Here's the Tory party back in 1906 standing under a cliff, Arthur Balfour leading his party against the Liberals into the election of 1906. Look what happened. A landslide of massive proportions, 211 losses the Tories suffered, Balfour was defeated, Campbell Bannerman came in, and there were about 15 years of Liberal government. There's Winston Churchill in 1945. Look at the Attlee landslide that engulfed him, and 187 losses then. Here's Alec Douglas Hume. Now, the worst Tory landslide since then that the Tories had suffered until tonight, a loss of 56 seats just in 1964. Now, here is John Major tonight, and the scale of the landslide he has suffered. Talking, of course, about forecast seats, but on the basis of our forecast, something like 190 losses could go down. So you see he's done worse than Winston Churchill. David. Thanks very much, Peter. Let's go to Stirling, where we have the result. 5,752. Michael Bruce Forsyth, Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, 13,971. <laughs> Anne McGuire, the Scottish Labour Party, 20,000.
Twen 20,382. William McMurdo, UK Independence Party, 154. Elaine Liv MacDonald Olson, Value Party candidate, 24. Alistair Tuch, Scottish Liberal Democrat, 2,675. and that Anne Maguire has been duly elected to serve <laughs> the Michael Forsyth Secretary of State for Scotland defeated their majority of six and a half thousand for Labour Anne Maguire who used to chair the Labour Party Scottish Labour Party here's the swing from Conservative to Labour eight percent not as high as has been recorded in the south in England but still a hefty swing may mean the Tories only have three seats left in Scotland at the end of the night Let's have a look at the, at the Scottish story, Peter, at this stage, can we? Even Scotland has been transformed. That was bad enough for the Conservatives last time when Labour had 50 and the Conservatives 11 seats. A lot of blue on the map, they're all the same, and these big seats up in the Highlands and down in the south. This is what we forecast now will happen in Scotland. Look how the map has changed colour with just one North Tayside seat up there. Eastwood and Gordon, the Tories down to about three seats, losing eight seats. The SNP on five, up to the Liberal Democrats probably gaining one as well. When... Anthony Eden was Prime Minister, the Tories had half the seats in Scotland. 72 seats in Scotland altogether, don't forget. 1966, Ted Heath was down to 20. And as you move along into the Thatcher period, you see it drifts right down to 10. That was the worst ever to date. John Major had 11 seats in Scotland last time, managed to bump it up one when his vote actually increased 2%. But now we're forecasting that John Major's Conservative Party will down to an all-time low of three seats in Scotland. David. Peter, thank you very much. Uh, the Liberal Democrats now are forecast, according to our forecast, to have 60 or more seats, 61 seats in the new Parliament. A staggering result, tripling their power in the House of Commons. Let's have a look at some of the results that have come in. It starts with the Labour gain, first of all, in Keithley. This was the seat that they had to win, one of the ones they had to win to form a government. And uh, Anne Cryer, the widow of Bob Cryer, who was killed in a car crash during the last parliament. Who used to be the MP for Bradford South. She gets a 10% swing and goes in to the House of Commons. Liberal Democrat gain in Sheffield Hallam. Richard Allen takes the seat from Irvin Patrick, the Conservatives. And uh, at how John Prescott is celebrating. Let's have a look at that. I don't know much of a celebration at the moment. It looks like they're celebrating in the pitch dark, but you can just pick out the picture of the man who's likely to be Deputy Prime Minister, John Prescott. He's the man who said when Tony Blair was elected leader, he was one of the challenges for the leadership after John Smith's death that Tony Blair frightened the hell out of the Tories and me, he said, and was widely thought to be cautious about the way that the new Labour revolution was being created. Anyway, he remained very loyal, was out of the country in his battle bus all the way through, um, and will no doubt be a loyal supporter of this government. We join Anna Ford, who's at well in Hatfield, David Evans constituency. Anna. Yes, well, in Hatfield, it could swing to Labour with a 5.8% swing, David. Uh, they're still counting here, and the result isn't going to come until 3 o'clock. I've got David Evans, the sitting MP, with me. David, it's not looking good, is it? Uh, it's not looking good, but it is well in Hatfield. Um, I like to think I'm a bit different to the normal Tory. And I think How would you I'll say win. you're different to the normal Tory? Well, I'll say what I think. You certainly Shoot do. from the hip. You said what you thought about your uh, Labour opponent, didn't you, Melanie Johnson? I think upset some of your constituents. Um, I did upset a few people, but then some of what I said, people have said you were right. And uh, on the doorstep, they said, oh, you shouldn't have said it, and then leant forward and said, but we agree with you. So we're going to find out in the next hour or so whether, I, whether they did agree with me or not. 
So if the swing is as big as it looks at the moment, who's to blame, do you think? Um, I think the government, broken promises, VAT on fuel, ERM fiasco, um, couldn't get their act together on Europe, I'm a Euro-sceptic, uh, Hessel, yeah, Tyne and Clark having far too much to say on it, and uh, calls, calls ripples. Blair's campaign was brilliant, um, he came across as a good Tory leader, and his policies came so near to ours, people wanted a change, People do like a change, and but I you understand. said in '95 you coined the phrase, didn't you? No change, no chance. Uh, yeah, when did. you were running the John Redwood I campaign, did. do you think they should have changed the leadership then? Oh, absolutely. So it's John Major's fault. No, it's not his fault. Nice man, sincere, wonderful. But we have been in trouble. He was presiding over the ERM fiasco. Uh, he did presume over uh, tax rises, which he promised wouldn't take place. He was the uh, leader when we put VAT on fuel, and all of those things added up to him wanting to reassert his authority uh, not so thank long ago. David Evans, thank you very much thank indeed. You. That's all from Welling and Hatfield so far. There were rather wild scenes at Putney when David Mellor's defeat was announced a moment ago. Say this to Sir James, to Sir James Goldsmith, who's got nothing to be smug about. And I would like to say, I would like to say that 1,500 votes is a derisory total. And we, and we have shown tonight that the referendum party is dead in the water. And Sir James, you can get off back to Mexico knowing your attempt to buy the British political system has failed. And uh, David Mellor is with Michael Burke. You've had this seat since 1979. You must be a disappointed man tonight. Yes, I'm sorry to lose, but you know it became pretty apparent. I think that um, uh, a, a tidal wave has burst over the Conservative Party tonight, and uh, it wasn't a question of putting your hand in the dike. It was a question of the seawall collapsing all around you. Um, but uh, I bear no grudges about that. I think that uh, we're not a one-party state, and it is inevitable at some point that um, uh, the government will change. It would appear now that Labour are on course for victory, and uh, as a patriot, I wish them well. There were uh, several colourful candidates in this particular oh. constituency, and noisy ones too, as, uh, as we've just heard. Do, do you think some of the uh, more publicised episodes in your own personal life might have contributed to your loss this evening, or no, do you think I, it was all part of the national no, picture? No, absolutely. I think it was part of that. Any, anyone who came round with me would have seen that, uh, in personal terms, one enjoyed a great deal of respect one's constituents, and I think our result is certainly not out of line with the country. No, I think it's important to explain that all that rowdiness was not due to the major parties, it had nothing to do with the Labour Party, nothing to do with the Liberals. It had to do with a small bunch of gun fanatics who stood against me because I led the fight on the Conservative benches to ban handguns and also from the referendum party. I think one thing needs to be made absolutely clear. We lost fair and square tonight to the Labour Party, and I don't, uh, you know, I may regret that, but I don't begrudge it. It's part of the inevitable process of politics. What I'm very delighted has happened is that Goldsmith has been stopped dead in his tracks. His 1,500 votes is a derisory vote. You know, I'm afraid that Putney said, up your hacienda, Jimmy. <laughs> And as far as uh, and as far as uh, as he's concerned, he can't buy the British political process, and he can go off back to Mexico, having failed almost as abysmally as his son-in-law did in Pakistan. And what's the future for David Miller? You've got obviously got well, an awful lot of outside interest. Is it the end of politics from your point of view? I don't know. It's too early to say. But as you know, if people sometimes ask, well, why do members of Parliament do other things? The answer is to have some basis to support their families on nights like this. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, thank goodness there are a few other shots in my locker. You may not tragically have heard the last of me yet, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> David Miller, thanks very much indeed. David Miller with Michael Burke in Putney. The Labour gain in Rochdale, which had Liz Lynn comforting one of her supporters who was in tears, is here on your screen with a majority of 4,500. Labour took the seat from the Liberal Democrats. There was a Liberal Democrat gain in Western Supermare. Remember, we're saying the Liberal Democrats are heading for 60-odd seats tonight. Majority of 1,200. Swing of 8% from Conservative to Labour there, but that's irrelevant because the Liberal Democrat gain, Brian Cotter, takes a seat from Margaret Daly. Upminster, Labour gain this from Sir Nicholas Bonser, defeated. He's been the MP since 1983 in this constituency. Keith Darville takes it with a swing of 15%, again. Starbridge, 11% swing there. Warren Hawksley out, and Deborah Shipley takes it.
the Conserve Boundary Commission almost halved the majority here, but still a very hefty swing from the 1992 result on these boundaries. Perth. Rosanna Cunningham, who took it in the by-election, takes Perth for the Scottish National Party. Majority of 3,000, so she's safely in there. The Scottish National Party so far have one gain and three holds. Now, John Sopel is a Conservative Party headquarters, testing the mood as if we need to ask what it was. John. Well, I think the mood has worsened as the evening progressed. Initially, they came out and said to us, the results don't seem to be as bad as we feared, and as the results have come in, they, the mood has darkened. And we've had a briefing from one of the architects of John Major's campaign, and he came out and essentially said, we had a choice. We had two forms of disunity over Europe. One was the wait-and-see option that we plumped for. The other was the nuclear option, which was to say no to a single currency. And this person, who was the architect of the campaign, essentially said, we picked the wrong option. We should have gone for ruling out a single currency. And that is exactly what Ken Clark suspected was going on here at Central Office, which caused ructions earlier in the year. And the Central Office are now saying, well, perhaps we should have gone for the uh, all-out option of saying no to a single currency. So already the post-mortem has started on the campaign. He thinks, incidentally, that it wouldn't have made any difference, that the Tories would have still lost the election, but perhaps not as badly. It's a curious moment, uh, John. We've got 122 seats in and only four Conservative seats at the moment. And, 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 the, and the prognosis from the, the war room, which is one floor above us, is that people like Michael Portillo are in serious danger. That perhaps the, who would have been the standard bearer for the right of the Conservative Party if there was a future leadership contest. And they're saying all sorts of other seats. They're, they're, they're thinking they're going to be slaughtered in London and the South East. And all the news seems to be grim and getting worse. John, thank you very much. We're joined by Anne Perkins now, who's at Wokingham, John Redwood's seat. Anne. Yes, well, John Redwood, uh, his declaration is not expected for some time yet. They are saying there's a very big turnout here. Uh, and Mr Redwood said he won't talk to us until after his declaration, but there has been feverish activity in the Redwood camp. He's been on his mobile phone scribbling frantic notes. So I assume he's been on the phone to his London headquarters and they're considering tactics because obviously we're here not because we don't think he's going to win this seat or hold this seat, which we are pretty confident he will, but because we want to know what he's going to say about the major leadership. And it seems to me that there are two possible options. Either uh, we hear from Mr Major very quickly that he's going to stand down, that is thought to favour John Redwood, or he might say that he will go, but not for some time. And that would give Redwood's rivals uh, a good chance uh, to, to stop him, of course, because he's been out of government for nearly two years. He's got a much uh, stronger base. He's much better organized. And what we're going to be looking for is this uh, post-mortem, which John Soper was indicating is already starting at central office. And I think that's why we've heard from other possible candidates in any leadership campaign, people like Michael Heseltine, people like William Hague, saying we mustn't we mustn't rush into it, we mustn't have public rows, we mustn't have public post-mortems. I heard William Hague talk about the need for cool, calm reflection. So what we're going to be looking for from John Redwood is exactly what he says uh, in terms of his analysis of the campaign, and particularly in the light of what John Sopel was saying about their analysis about Europe, uh, where, of course, he has always been a strong Eurosceptic, what he says on that issue. OK, and thank you very much indeed. We'll be back with you later on. News from Torbay is that there is a recount there, Liberal Democrats challenging Rupert Allison, the Tory, and it's over two votes. So they're as close as that, and it's a second recount, and if it's true, it's two votes. Down there in Torbay, it's the narrowest victory for whoever it is who's won, we don't yet know, since about 1931. The other thing is that Sir Marcus Fox defeated at Shipley. Sir Marcus Fox, who's chairman of the 1922 Backbench Conservative Committee, a staunch supporter of John Major's, a Yorkshireman who was supposedly going to hang on into this next parliament, even though he said that a chairman of the committee should resign at each parliament to handle John Major's succession, has been defeated on a 14% swing. And Christopher Leslie takes that seat. Now we join Lance Price, who's in Enfield, where Michael Portillo is in trouble, you think, Lance Price? Well, the indications we're getting are that the, uh, that the piles on the tables are looking pretty level between Michael Portillo and his Labour opponent, Stephen Twigg. 
no one is prepared to uh, say what the result is going to be. Uh, Labour earlier on this evening were really ruling out the possibility of them winning this seat. As the evening has gone on, they've become uh, rather more confident. They still don't quite believe that they can do it, but uh, both Labour and the Liberal Democrats are telling us that those piles are looking pretty level. Well, if that's true, it will really upset the apple cart of the leadership battle for the Tory party, won't it? It certainly would, because Michael Portillo clearly sees himself as the standard bearer of the right uh, come the leadership election. And I think we've been getting some clear indications from him as to how he thinks it ought to be played. On this programme, he was talking about the need for a, a careful, measured look at what went wrong. That, I think, was an indication that uh, he doesn't want John Major to resign straight away. He was also stressing the need for the party to be united if it's to come back. And I think uh, this would be his principal card against John Redwood, the argument that he is better placed uh, as a candidate of the right to bring the party together in the wake of this massive defeat uh, than John Redwood is. Thanks very much. Well, Nicholas Witchell is at Henley, Michael Heseltine's seat. Now, this is a very curious state of affairs if Portillo goes down. Do you get the impression Michael Heseltine is thinking of standing for the leadership or hoping to inherit the leadership of a defeated Conservative Party? David, I think it is undeniable that the, the friends and associates of Michael Heseltine believe that uh, if, and I suppose one must uh, start to think of when John Major steps aside, that uh, Michael Heseltine has the energy and the ambition at the age of 64 once again to challenge for the leadership of the Conservative Party. They believe, in fact, that he uh, probably would have the support of John Major. They say that he would have the stature and the experience to effectively counter uh, a Prime Minister Blair in the House of Commons and around the country and they say that uh, Mr Heseltine should not be wholly unacceptable to the Eurosceptics. They point out that uh, it was Mr Heseltine who was the inspiration for perhaps the most controversial and maybe the most effective uh, Conservative poster of the election, the one with Mr Blair sitting on the knee of uh, Chancellor Cole. Nick, thanks very much indeed. Peter. This election isn't bad enough for the Tories. The opposition are succeeding in bringing their fire to bear on the seats that matter to each of them. Here are the Conservative Labour seats. This is the battle Labour are having for Conservatives, where the Liberal Democrats don't matter. Labour vote shooting up at 11.5%. Lib Dem vote well down. Here over at the other side, here are the seats where the Conservatives are fighting the Liberal Democrats. Labour vote only up 4%. The Liberal Democrats up a massive 7% in the seats that matter to them. Tactical voting is going on, opposition maximising its fire where it really matters. The Liberal Democrat battleground now. There are the Liberal Democrat seats that they held in the old Parliament. The taller they are, the safer they were. There's Rochdale, which of course, as we know, went down. These are now, I've added on here, the target seats the Liberal Democrats have from the other parties. Notice how they're massively concentrated in the South and they're largely Tory seats. Let's just line them up. There are the Liberal Democrat seats in the last Parliament. There are their targets. Here are the ones that have declared. We've ranked them, of course, by their vulnerability. Here we go now. These are the ones that have declared so far. Rochdale's gone for Labour. Montgomery's has been held on to in the two of the existing seats. Here's their target seats now. Of course, they were all blue before and red for Labour. And here's how they've gone. None have been held, except the Labour ones, by the Tories. Portsmouth South, Hazelgrove, Southport, Western Superman, North Avon. North Avon, a long shot for the Liberal Democrats, has gone down to them. And here's our forecast. Hold all their seats they will in the old Parliament, except for Inverness East and Rochdale, we reckon. And of their targets, they're going to hit a very, very large number. Bunch them together very closely. They've got an awful lot of seats in Parliament. David. Martin Bell arriving at his count at Tatton, former BBC war reporter, going into his uh, constituency. Count there. It's said to be very close at Tatton. And the headline there, Michael Brown defeated at Cleethorpes, one of those uh, Tory candidates who are under a slight cloud at the moment, being investigated by Sir Gordon Downey. Well, now, Robin, we haven't heard from you for a bit because these results have been coming in so fast. Um, what's your comment on the state of things with this majority, 170 or so we're talking about now for Labour? Well, the, the Tories are clearly going to be absolutely devastated. I think one of the interesting things about all the results we've had in so far are the number of women uh, MPs that we're going to see in the next House of Commons. It looks as though it'll be at least 100 women MPs. A number of those uh, marginal victories that Labour has had, it's been a female victor. Uh, the next House of Commons is going to look very different, I think. And There's Martin Bell. Uh arriving inside. We only saw his back before in his white suit. And um, had, he not, uh, had he not decided to stand for Parliament and leave the BBC, he would have been up at Edinburgh 
Pentlands with Malcolm Rifkin tonight, which is what he'd been booked to do before he took this step of going to fight for clean, independent party in Tatton. And I think reckoned he'd taken on rather more than he bargained for when he got there. He said it was, when he did his first press conference, he said Sniper's Alley was a safer place to be than uh, facing the press. But he was clearly learning fast on the job. <laughs> so anyway, um, go on from where you were. What's going what's, well, what's to happen in the Tory party, in your view? Well, the Tory party is going to have to really go back to square one after a result like this, because another interesting factor tonight is that conservative opponents of a single currency, those who come out against a single currency, are doing no better than other conservatives. So... OK, Tony King, just brief word. Turnout is down. It's very striking. We may well have the lowest turnout uh, since the Second World War. Uh, turnout's down an average of about six and a half points. We're down in the low 70s. Uh, a lot of Conservatives, they might, if they'd gone and voted, have voted Labour or Liberal Democrat, but almost certainly a lot of Conservatives have stayed home. Just lack of, lack of enthusiasm being expressed that way. Peter? We look again at the Liberal Democrats just to see what sort of records they're going to break. There's Herbert Asquith in, in, in 1923 with 158 Liberal Democrats in Parliament. The last time they were in three figures. 1929, Lloyd George, 59 Liberal Democrat MPs. Down to 36 in 1931. Then that long period in the wilderness when they were down to six, uh, less than that sometimes, 12, 6, 11. 1983, the Alliance 23, their best post-war record up to now. But then we had uh, 1992, Ashton down to just 18 seats in the last parliament. And then now we're forecasting that he'll be at 54 in 1997. He's way back to the kind of levels that Lloyd George had at the beginning of the 1930s. David. We're about to get uh, Paddy Ashton's count. Here we are at the Liberal Democrat Party headquarters. They're watching your graphic, Peter. And enthusiastically cheering that uh, 54, which I hate to say has now fallen to 53, but anyway. And down at Yeovil, Paddy Ashton's count. Nothing much seems to be going on there at the moment. The majority of 8,000 there. He's gradually increased it over the years. Jane Corbyn is down there. Jane. Yes, David, you've joined us here at Yeovil, and we're very close to a declaration. It's a, a happy night here, I think one can safely say, for the uh, Liberal Democrats. Paddy Ashdown's being a bit cautious still. He'll only say he's very encouraged, but I overheard him sort of say fantastic and punch the air when one of those good results for the Liberals came in. And currently, of course, uh, they're looking at six seats that they've taken, some of them very low down on their target list, seats like Sheffield, Hallam, and they're feeling pretty good here. He is, however, on tenterhooks about the Torbay result, with, I understand, two votes either way between the Liberal Democrats and the Tories. But I think, you know, pretty, pretty happy down here in Yeovil tonight as uh, he waits for the result of, of his count. Um, there have been disappointments. Uh, Rochdale lost, Liz Lynn's gone. Uh, Oldham East, Chris Davis, uh, both of them, he told me earlier, personal friends of his, and he's very sad about that. But uh, obviously, uh, those games are the things he'll be thinking about right now as he waits uh, for, for the count, waits for the declaration. Uh, okay, to come Jane, up. thank you very much indeed. We'll come back to you as soon as it's imminent. And in the meantime, let's just have a look at some other results. We've had one or two more ministers defeated. Ian Sprout and Tom Sackville have been defeated. Here are the figures Leeds Northwest. A Labour gain, Dr. Keith Hampson defeated there on a swing of 12%. Bolton West, a Labour gain, Tom Sackville, who is the junior Home Office Minister, he's out, majority of 7,000, a 11% swing. Labour gain, Cleethorpes, Michael Brown, who faces accusations that he failed to declare money paid to him by a lobbying firm. Sir Gordon Downey hasn't yet declared his findings on this and he's been defeated on a 15% swing Stockton South Labour gain Tim Devlin defeated here and Darry Taylor moves in this is CT and Rigglesworth used to hold for the SDP briefly he won it in 1983 16% swing against the Conservatives Hales Owen and Rowley Regis again an 11% swing Sylvia Heal takes the seat. 
and Harwich, a Labour gain. This is Ian Sprout. Ian Sprout's been in a number of seats, and every time he moves, it seems to go wrong for him. And he's defeated there. Sittingbourne and Sheppey. Sir Roger Moat defeated here. Tory held seat and a swing of 14 and a half, 15 percent in Sittingbourne and Sheppey. Let's go back down to Yeovil, where we think Paddy Ashdown's result is about to come through. If you go the other side. Paddy Ashdown's gradually built up his majority here. He uh, took the seat in 1983, became leader of the Liberal Democrats, or leader the of the Liberal the Party, in 1988. Is John Robert Archer, musician, 306, 306. John Jeremy, Paddy Ashdown, official Liberal Democrat candidate, 26,349, 26349. John Caldwell Beveridge, the Referendum Party candidate, 3,574, 3,574. <laughs> Nicholas David John Pambrook, the Conservative Party candidate, 14,946, 14,946. Patrick Joseph Anthony Conway, the Labour Party candidate, 8,053, 8,053. Christopher John Peter Hudson, the Rainbow Dream Ticket Party, 97, 97. David Ronald Taylor, Green Party candidate, 728, 728. And I declare that Paddy Ashton has been elected to serve as the member for the Oval constituency. And his headquarters there cheering at his result, which is majority up from 8,700 to 11,400. George, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm I am privileged indeed to be given the trust of the people of Yeovil to serve them again, and I look forward to doing that in the future uh, again. It's a tremendous privilege and a tremendous honour. I'd like especially to thank my campaign team, um, who in my absence have once again won this seat for me, and I'm very grateful to all of them for the tremendous hard work, and especially my agent, Nick Speakman. And if I may also say, my uh, colleagues from the other candidates, from the other parties, who have fought this seat have fought a vigorous and uh, honourable campaign and I wish them well in the future. And also to the returning officer and all the staff and the police and others who make this election possible. I do not yet know what the result of this uh, election will be, although I think the trends are now fairly clear. I do not wish to predict the future, but I will say this, that I think we are now going to see a change of government and I believe that there will be a very substantial, perhaps even a two-thirds majority, for constitutional change and the modernization of our system of government in the next parliament. And uh, I believe that can deliver a new era for our country, an era of uh, politics which is more in touch with people, and an era in particular where uh, more power is in the hands of the voter and perhaps less in the hands of the political establishment and the elites. And I think that will be a very, very good thing for our democracy. For our part, we shall use the votes that are given to us tonight in this constituency and elsewhere where we've already made a number of gains to make sure that in the next parliament we continue to fight for the things that we have fought for during this campaign. Above all, for more investment in education, for more investment in the health service to tackle the crisis, and for a clear commitment to make sure that the constitution of our country is modernized to make our country ready for the next century. Thank you all very much indeed. The Liberal Democrats with a good result in his own constituency and heading for over 50 now in the country as a whole and talking about change and reformation of the constitution which he's hoping to get through the uh, cooperation with Labour. Now let's just see how things stand. We've had 175 or so results in and this is the state of the parties. 154 for Labour, up 31, and the Conservatives on 8, down 37, Liberal Democrats on 8, up 5, one uh, gain for the National Party, SNP, and they're on 5. And with those results in, our current forecast, a Labour majority of 167, the biggest ever Labour majority. The share of the vote, Labour comfortably in with 44%. Note, incidentally, nobody ever gets over 50%. Over half 
those who go to the polls. Conservatives on 31%, hasn't been done since the war. Liberal Democrats on 18%, others on 7%. Among the losers so far tonight, with many more to come, Michael Forsyth, Scottish Secretary, in Stirling, David Mellor, in Putney, the former Heritage Secretary, Sir Marcus Fox, Chairman of the 1922 Backbench Committee, and David Hunt, the former Cabinet Minister, and other Tories biting their nails at this moment. And Liz Lynn, Social Security Lib Dem from Rochdale. Tony Blair, speaking at Sedgefield after his uh, result was announced there, saying, you put your trust in me, I tend to repay that trust, I will not let you down. David Evans, the Tory who was in trouble at well in Hatfield, conceding that Blair's campaign was brilliant, he came across as a very good Tory leader. Though at the same time refusing to criticize the Prime Minister, saying he was a good chap too. David Mellor, the party's won tonight, not on a socialist platform, but on a platform of moderation. Most of his time seemed to be spent trying to send Sir James Goldsmith back to Mexico. So let's have a look at one or two of the results we've had in specifically, one by one, Hornchurch as uh, a Labour gain, this is on the Essex border, a swing of 16%, Robin Squire out there. Hove has been gained. Very strong Tory seat normally, Sir Tim Sainsbury held it in the last Parliament, a 16% swing from Tory to Labour. Kingswood, a Labour win in Kingswood, boundary changes here which have changed the seat around on the eastern side of Bristol, 14% swing. Coventry South, Paul Ivey out, Jim Cunningham takes the seat again in theory a Conservative seat but this was the seat that uh, Dave Nellis st stood as an independent Labour after his expulsion because of militant, his connections with militant at the last election which allowed the Tories in, so a swing there of 13%. So there we are, we've had 182 results in, many more to come, they're coming in fast now. Let's join Jeremy Paxman. Jeremy. Well, Cecil Parkinson, if you can't even hold hove, something seismic is happening here, isn't it? Well, it clearly is. I mean, we have these uh, amazing, highly improbable swings, and they seem to be repeating themselves regularly. Yes, this is a very significant uh, evening for us. What are you going to do tomorrow? What are you going to advise people to do tomorrow? Well, tomorrow, I think everybody takes a deep breath. And I think Michael Heseltine was absolutely right. Uh, we uh, analyze the result in private, and we don't start squabbling and trying to apportion blame. We try to find out where things went wrong. For heaven's sake, if you're squabbling almost openly during an election campaign, it's going to get a great deal worse afterwards, isn't it? No, I don't think it will. I think we will, uh, uh, quite frankly, at the mm. moment, uh, and I'm being frivolous yeah. now, but there don't seem to be enough people to have a good squabble there. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think we will uh, regroup, analyze the result, and uh, remember the better times, and work out how we get back to where we were. David? Thank you. There's um, some trouble going like on at Glasgow Govan, apparently, where the result's being announced. Police involved in scuffles. Mohammed Sawa for Labour, millionaire Asian businessman who was first of all ruled out in the selection process here and then had a reballot and won it and will be the first Muslim MP if elected. And here he is acknowledging his victory. I would also like to thank my campaign team, my wife. Well, let's go back to Jeremy Paxman. Um, Neil Kinnock, um, I suppose it seems to be the case that Middle England has come across to Tony Blair. Now, and what? Middle Scotland and Middle Wales. Sure, yeah. but it does rather beg the question, I don't want to be too personal, but I mean, why will they do it for him and they wouldn't do it for you? I think he's very good and he's very appealing. I also think, as Tony would say himself, indeed has said himself, that an additional five years of experience produced that shift, which instead of being a slippage, to benefit Labour is an avalanche. But it's the, I mean, it seems to be the case that those areas of England in particular which are doing quite well in the economy, the so-called booming Britain, uh, are actually voting most heavily for Labour. That yes. implies that they thought they could take the risk 
under him and they didn't think they could take the risk under you. Well, if that's the case, I'm prepared to accept it. I'm just delighted that mm. it's happened at this time and Tony is the leader. I would say this, however, that the areas that you describe are also the areas that have experienced the greatest insecurity, a novel experience for many people, and they can attribute that insecurity directly to the policies of Conservative government, not just in the last five years, but cumulatively they, over the period. And now they are casting their votes on that basis. Th this is going to stretch your imagination, but which seat uh, on tonight's performance would, would you be most surprised to find you'd won? Very difficult to say. I think that if John Major becomes right. an ex-MP tomorrow, I'd be surprised. Neil, can it, we'll be back to you in a shortly. David. Thank you very much. We've got a Labour gain in Eastwood. Um, a rather spectacular result there. 14% swing from Conservative to Labour, the safest seat, the equivalent of the Tories, I don't know, losing Isha or something oh, in England. Second safer seat for the Conservatives in Scotland. And Labour gain the Vale of Glamorgan. John Smith takes this seat back. He had a 19 majority at the last election. He's turned that, a loss by 19, he's turned it into a 10,500 majority, 10% swing. Now, these targets, how, how are they doing? What's left? What's happening to the Tories? Right, well, now let's take a look at how Mr. Blair's targeting of his key seats is working. We're going to have a look now at his, uh, the aim. Uh, in the shooting gallery over here. Here are the target seats before they were declared. 96 of them Tory ones for Labour and just three of them Liberal Democrat and one of them Clyde Cymru over there. Now, the higher that block looked like Portsmouth North, the safest of all these Labour target seats they were aiming at in order to get a comfortable majority. There's the tallest of them. There are the ones that have declared so far, Portsmouth North, Putney, Battersea, Norwich North, Basel, all these ones here. Some of them quite small, but some of them quite difficult ones like Cleethorpes for Labour to gain. Now, watch the little boxes down here. He would have needed just 57 for an overall majority. How many is he going to get in just the ones declared so far? Heading for Portsmouth North on the south coast first. There goes uh, Kingswood. There goes Portsmouth North. Substantial Labour majorities instead. There's Basildon, now a huge Labour majority. Here we go now off the Bale of Glamorgan. A stunning great tower of red there. Up into the north, Bradford, Leeds. Uh, there's Stockton South and finally Stirling in Scotland. What's going to happen there? That was Michael Forsyth's seat. That's now a comfortable Labour seat in Scotland. 24 hits. On the target then, 24 absolutely slap bullseyes for Labour, no misses so far. Here's our forecast of the way it's going to go. Clocking up now to out of 198 hits, two misses. We think he might just miss Keredigian in West Wales, Clyde Cymru holding that. And Conway, although it's a Labour target, might just go to the Lib Dems. David. Thanks very much, Peter. Well now, various seats at risk or it, people in difficulty. Sue Cameron is at Harrogate. Is Norman Lamont going to lose Harrogate, Sue? That's a very, very strong possibility. He's been looking extremely glum throughout the, uh, the campaign. He's had to fight off a very, very strong uh, challenge from Phil Willison, the Liberal Democrat leader uh, of the local council. Norman Lamont, of course, uh, is well known, former chancellor, uh, and it was expected that perhaps he might hold on, but it is looking extremely doubtful now as to whether he will make it. Okay, Nisha Pile is in Stevenage, which is where Barbara Follett is fighting the seat. Is she safe as houses there? It's a top Labour target. She's supremely confident of winning, David, and that's not just because of the results that are coming through across the country, but because her own private canvassing during today is indicating that Labour have a swing of something like 14 to 15 percent. Now, earlier in the evening when I was talking to her about it, she almost couldn't believe that it could be possible. Now, of course, it looks like it's being confirmed right around the country. Well, I mean, she'd be well in, as, and he needs a 3 percent swing or so, but what would happen to her if she does win? What, 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 does she, what does she expect to, to do in the new parliament? Because she was quite influential in creating the sort of Labour image, wasn't she? Absolutely. But she, was said to be the person, she was said to be the person who got Robin Cook to wear brown suits because it went with his um, red hair. Yes, and to trim his beard. Um, more recently, of course, she's been championing women's issues, the, well. the need to get more women into Could Parliament, and the results we've seen so Russell. far this evening have confirmed how successful that movement has been. She was a leading light in the Emily's List group, and uh, I think she's going to be very pleased. Thank you very much, Thank Nisha Pile. Now, now, Dennis Mahoney in Falmouth and Camborne, where Sebastian Coe is in difficulty, 
Or is he? He is indeed, David, yes. Good morning from Falmouth and Camborne. It's all gone wrong for Seb Coe. This seat was a tight three-way marginal, but Seb looking depressed as he watches the votes come in. It's now a two-way race between Labour and the Liberal Democrats. The Liberal Democrats come second here in the last three general elections, and they're hoping to take the seat. But with Labour's performance tonight, it's anyone's guess. It's going to be a race to the finish. Thanks very much. Tony, um, anything else to add to this while we wait to go to Enfield? Oh, something very important is happening. The Conservative Party is becoming a minority English party. There's every chance that the Conservatives will have no seats at all in Wales after this election. It's perfectly possible they will have at most one or two seats in Scotland. The Celts clearly don't like the Tories. The Tories are virtually being eliminated from that part of the world. And that is really a... a a fundamental change in the structure of the British political system. Here is the Unionist Party being driven out of important parts well, of the I Union. I said at the beginning this is what happened after Gladstone's Midlothian campaign. The Tories were in retreat and in a minority in England. I think that's correct, isn't it? You're the historian, oh, I'm not. Uh, it's certainly not unprecedented. The Liberal Party in the 19th century totally dominated Scottish and Welsh politics. But to see this happening, this is a hundred years later we're talking about. Mr. Gladstone's been in his grave for a long time. And it is, uh, I think, a sign that something really fundamental and probably nearly permanent has happened. One of the things worth noticing, by the way, is that the Labour Party, in terms of its share of the vote, is not actually doing spectacularly well. It's getting about the same share of the vote it got, for example, winning a narrow majority in 1964. What's happening is that Labour is doing pretty well, the Liberal Democrats are doing pretty well, and that there is enormous tactical voting on behalf of those two parties. Where Liberal Democrats don't think they have a chance, they're going Labour. Where Labour people think they don't have a chance, they're going Liberal Democrat. And the Conservatives are simply being squeezed in between these two forces and they are down to and will remain at their worst figure in this century by a wide margin. The result of uh, the count in Dumfries we have, the Labour gain there, 16% swing, taking the seat from Struan Stevenson, third safer seat in Scotland and uh, Romford a Labour gain, Sir Michael Newbert out there. This was a classic stronghold of the Conservative Party in Essex. It's been taken by Eileen Gordon. Pudsey, Peter Bone defeated there, new Tory candidate. And a swing of 13% against him. The seat's taken by Paul Truswell. Bedford, Robert Blackman, the candidate there, defeated on a swing of 13%. Again, another huge swing. So the state of the parties, let's just have a look at that. It's 2 o'clock, just after. 215 results in, 190 for Labour, up 37. Conservatives down 43 on 10. Liberal Democrats, 9, up 5. And the National Parties, up 1. A sensational, a sensational result for Labour. And this is how it's been coming through to us here in the studio. And up at Sedgefield Labour Club in Trimden, Tony Blair has arrived. Can't see him. I think they're waiting for him. Well, when he arrives there, we'll, uh, we'll get pictures of it. The surprising sort of hat you normally see at Conservative Party clubs. But um, Labour's 
had the bulldog in the campaign and they've wrapped themselves in the Union flag and they can wear the Union Jack on their hats. Paddy Ashdown joins us now from Yeovil, the leader of the Liberal Democrats. Mr Ashdown, um, it looks as though you're heading for something like 50 seats at the moment on a 17% vote, which is a bit less than your popular vote last time. It means your vote has been, in your words, effectively used, doesn't it? Well, I, I don't make predictions until the results are known, and then they're not predictions, David. As you know, I dislike predictions. Uh, so let's wait and see what the result is. But all the signs we're seeing is that there is a comprehensive endorsement from people in the country, especially in the seats that we've won for the messages that we've put in what was a positive campaign, which centred on, on two key things, investment in education and tackling the crisis in the health service. And we'll use every vote that people have armed us with and the mandate they've given us and the seats that we've won to ensure that in the next parliament we push that agenda forward as no other party will. Mr Ashton, I'll come back to you in a moment. We've just got a declaration coming through. If you could stay with us for a second. I'm afraid I the can't. referendum party candidate, 1,337. Neville Arthur Kenyon, Liberal Democrat, 4,536. And I hereby declare David Michael Chater to be elected a member of parliament for the very north constituency. So, Berry North, a Labour game. A defeat of Alistair Burt. So, um, Mr Ashdown, you, you were saying in your speech when you, uh, when you had the count uh, that you looked to the Liberal Democrats to influence the changes in the nature of politics and the Constitution and all that. There's going to be obviously a hefty Labour majority. Do you think that Tony Blair will still stand by that commitment he gave to try and bring other parties in on the left into a sort of new cooperative agreement or some such? Well, the Liberal Democrats are not on the left, Mr Dimbleby, as you well know. We're a radical party, but we're an independent and distinctive one. Uh, if Mr Blair is uh, interested, as I believe he is, in a more pluralist approach to politics, that's a very, very good thing. We have to break out of the destructive tribalism in British politics, and uh, I've been committed to that for five or six years now, and the strength of the Liberal Democrats will reinforce that process if Mr Blair wishes to pursue it. As to the constitutional change, he's made a, an agreement. I believe him to be, I know him to be an honourable man. I'm sure that agreement will be fulfilled. What I'm clear about is that the Liberal Democrats now are a force that guarantees uh, the modernisation of our constitution in the next three or four years. And for that, say, uh, for that reason, I believe that the next parliament will indeed be a momentous and historical one. How do you mean guarantees? Well, if we get the, the more seats that we have, the more likely we will be able to buttress and push forward that process of a reform to proportional representation? No, not just pro proportional representation. You know as well as I that there's a constitutional package. It includes such things as a Bill of Rights, as a Freedom of Information Act, as a measure of sensible devolution in this country. It means overhauling our political system. And that is very important. All politicians ought to recognize that they have now lost the trust of the British people in a way that we have not uh, seen before. And that's a very major problem for our democracy. We must now begin to address how it is we rebuild a link between government and governed in this country in order to rebuild that trust, constitutional change, the modernization of our system of government, investment in, uh, in education uh, and investment in health, and a clear and honest position on taxation is all part of that process. Isn't it a difficulty for you that you get this strength, this new strength in the House of Commons, something like two and a half or maybe three times what you had before, at the very moment that Labour roars ahead and gets a vast majority for itself, thus diminishing any influence you may have once I, again. I doubt that, um, but let's wait and see how the results play out and in particular how the next parliament is made up. Uh, again, we can spend a lot of time making predictions about the future. Um, tomorrow morning is good enough time for that. Mr Ashdown, thank you very much. John Sopel joins us now from Tory party headquarters. John. David, I've just been handed a news release from the Tory reform group who represent the left of the party and a sign of the bloodbath that perhaps is to come in the Conservative Party. Let me just read you a section of it. The election defeat that the Conservative Party experienced was wholly unnecessary. It was brought about by the rank treachery of the Tory right. They, ably assisted by the newspapers that back them, have run a vile campaign of hatred against John Major and his administration almost from the moment of the sensational victory of 1992. And it goes on, those who cheered the defeat of 
of Chris Patton at Lord McAlpine's home in 92 are all too typical of those on the right of the Conservative Party who've since worked tirelessly to remove John Major and to destroy the Tory party. Their actions are unforgivable. Now, this is being handed out here at Conservative HQ. The press releases are already being started to circulate from the left. No doubt we'll be hearing from the right wing of the party as well. But I, th I think the omens from this sort of thing are not very good for the party. Party of brotherly love. Thanks very much, John. Let's go down to Torbay because we have the result, we think, after many recounts. I'm not quite sure how many coming through from Torbay. This was a Liberal Democrat challenge to Rupert Allison, the sitting MP. It looks like a scene from South Pacific at the count at Torbay. Expect them to break into song. Okay. The as returning officer for the Torbay constituency, I hereby give notice that the number of votes recorded for each candidate is as follows. Alison Rupert William Simon, the Conservative Party candidate, 21,082. Booth Graham Harry, the UK Independence Party candidate. We're going to Harrogate now, Norman Lamont's result. 322. Mont, former Chancellor of the Exchequer. Willis, looking very sombre there. George Philip, known as Phil Willis, mm -hmm. Liberal Democrat, 24,000. <laughs> Victory in Harrogate and Knaresborough. Quiet. Could I, please, please, I, please let me let me finish reading the result. Twenty-four thousand five hundred and twenty-four thousand five hundred and fifty-eight. And Rupert Allison and has I lost Torbay to the Liberal Democrats, the so that's a double person, victory for the Liberal Phil Democrats. Has been duly elected to serve as the member for the Phil Willis takes it, and a third gain there. So Harrogate and Knaresborough, Norman Lamont, is in second place to Phil Willis, the Liberal Democrat, leader of Harrogate Council. At this election, well, majority of 6,000 turning round and 9,000 majority Mill, for the Conservatives last time round. Voting for more than one candidate, 19. Writing or mark by which a voter could be identified, 5. An unmarked or voting... Well, as they go on with the count there, in a moment we should be able to see the result from Torbay. Ballot papers rejected. Which was the Liberal Democrat gain by Rupert Allison. There you are, 12 votes, majority. Tayside North taken by the Scottish National Party. So Torbay, 12 votes after recounts. Rupert Allison, Nigel West, the writer, is defeated there. And the Liberal Democrats take Torbay. It's where they had their Eva Poe campaigning speech just the day before yesterday. Kenneth Clark in Rushcliffe pondering these results, knowing that some of the challenges for the leadership are in trouble. Michael Portillo may well be in trouble in Enfield. Edinburgh Pentland. 4511. James Alfred Civic, referendum party candidate, 526, 526. Gavin Steele Strang, the Scottish Labour Party This is Gavin Strang's result. These are being declared at the same place. Gavin Strang, the Shadow Agriculture Minister, with his safest seat there. We're still waiting for Malcolm Rifkin's result to come through. Scottish Conservative and Unionist candidate. So we join Lance Price now in Enfield to hear how things are going there. This running story, Lance. Yes, well, we've had some extraordinary results tonight, as we've been hearing, but I think we are about to have perhaps the most extraordinary. It looks from all the indications that we are hearing from all the parties that Michael Portillo has lost his seat here at Enfield Southgate. We're expecting to get the result perhaps in the next 10 to 15 minutes. But uh, as I say, all the indications so far is that one of the leading contenders for the leadership of the Conservative Party in the event of John Major's Thank resignation Robin. has lost his seat. Lance, thanks very much. Robin Oakley, if Michael Portillo is really out, what does that do for the leadership? 
Well, it's a devastating blow for the Tory right, and particularly for those on the Tory right who don't want to see John Redwood get the job after John Major. Obviously, this increases John Redwood's chances of being the standard bearer of the right in any Tory leadership contest. I think it makes it uh, much more likely now that William Hague will stand, a 36-year-old candidate who uh, is seen as a man of the right, but who doesn't upset the left in the way that Redwood and Portillo do. Does it, does it make it easier for Kenneth Clark? I'm keeping an eye on Sedgefield Labour just to see if Tony Blair arrives there. Does it make it easier for Kenneth Clark or for Michael Heseltine or those on the left that Portillo is out of the running, if he is out of the running? I think the degree of the Conservative defeat, the, the route it is now becoming, makes the Tories inclined to look much harder at the men of experience like Michael Heseltine and Kenneth Clark and perhaps to pay a little bit less attention to the ideological bent of some of their candidates. But what do, you make of this, what, do you make of this, what do you make of this thing that John Sopel read out from the Tory reform group? I mean, it sounds as though the party is imploding or exploding that, at the moment. That's a sign of the bitterness to come. I mean, the Tory reform group uh, do not speak for all that many Conservatives, but that is a clear sign of just how much bloodletting we might see and how rough it could get. Let me just have a word with William Hague, who's at Conservative Party headquarters. Mr Hague, what do you make of this Tory reform group uh, pamphlet that's going around right inside the headquarters where you are at the moment, accusing people in the party of treachery? Actually, I haven't seen it going around here uh, you in the haven't headquarters, seen it? although somebody has picked it up from somewhere. But I don't think most members of the Conservative Party would make much of that. I think they would agree that what the party will need is a period of cool and calm reflection uh, that should take at least several months well, what uh, in John order Sop to learn the lessons of what has happened tonight. What John Sopel was reading out to us suggests that the, there are people in the Conservative Party who don't feel like that at all and feel that blame should be attributed immediately and something done about it. There should be a bloodletting. Well, of course, there will always be people with hard feelings after a result like the one uh, that we are seeing at the moment that seems to be taking shape across the country. Uh, but I think the sensible course, and the course that the vast majority of people in the Conservative Party will want to follow, is one of very cool and calm reflection, of making sure that lessons are learned, but also making sure we don't lose sight of the fact that we are very proud of what we have achieved in this country. We don't stop being proud of it uh, if, we, if it looks like we are losing an election. OK, thank you very much indeed for joining us again. There, Tony Blair, not arrived yet. Peter, while we're not waiting David, for Yes, indeed. Now, just look at this extraordinary picture of the country. Here it is, with all these forecast gains for Labour in the Midlands. Not a single Tory forecast for Wales, just one Conservative seat in Scotland, Gordon up there forecast. So the situation now in Wales is that Anthony Eden with half the seats in Wales back in 55 had been followed by his successors with a handful of seats there, but John Major now with just no seats in Wales forecast, David. Peter, thank you very much indeed. We've got a declaration in Glasgow, Galloway and up in Isdale, Ian Lang's seat. Ian Lang, 2,400 majority here. He was Secretary of State for Scotland. Now he's Trade and Industry I'm now Secretary. I'm about to announce the result for the Galloway a and Upton Nisdale Scottish National Party target. I, James Maguire Smith, being the returning officer for the parliamentary election in Galloway and Upper Nisdale, hereby give notice of the total number of votes polled for each candidate in the Galloway and Upper Nisdale constituency was as follows. Katie Clark, the Scottish Labour Party candidate, 6,861. Six. <laughs> Katie Clark, the Scottish Labour Party candidate, 6,861. Six, eight. Mr. Flynn, could I ask you to assist those who have not been listening and do not wish to be courteous? Katie Clark, the Scottish Labour Party candidate, 6,861, 6861. Alan Kennedy, the referendum party, 428, 428. Ian Lang, Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party candidate, 12,825, 12825. John Ewan McKercher, Scottish Liberal Democrat, 2700 2700. Alistair Morgan, Scottish National Party, 18,000. Yeah! 
Alistair Morgan, Scottish National Party, 18,449, 18449. Joseph Smith, UK Alex Salmon watching this Party, result from his account at Banff and Buckland as the SNP take Wood, Galloway and Upper Nisdale and Ian Lang, another cabinet minister to fall, is defeated with a majority of, of 5,600. The Scottish National Party take that seat. Tony Blair is now speaking at the Labour Club in the Sedgefield. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And, well, you know me, I'm never complacent, but... <laughs> no, it's looking very good all around the country. I just want to say a few things to you on this evening that is more moving and more important certainly than any of my life before. I want to say to you, first of all, thank you because it's you people here who've been my foundation and support all the way through my political career. And you've given me the chance to lead my party and I hope now to lead my country. Thank you. This is Tony Blair speaking at the Sedgefield Labour Club at this moment. As you know, it was here in this constituency that we created New Labour. Here that we recognised how important it was that we took the values of the Labour Party, the basic beliefs in justice and progress and a fair deal for ordinary people, in a sense of community and society, and we said these are the values of the Labour Party, but we've got to make them live and breathe again for the modern world. And we did it. And we built a party here of which we're proud. Yeah. <laughs> proud because we knew that all over this country there were people that were crying out for a sensible, mainstream, moderate alternative to the Conservative Party a party they could support and look up to and respect, a party that would set about changing the things in British society that people know need changing. Decent schools for all our children, not just a few. A national health service rebuilt as the pride of the nation again. Our young people given hope, our elderly security in their old age, a nation reborn and renewed. That is what New Labour was always about. Not just about changing the Labour Party, but changing it for a purpose so that we could make the changes in our country that we know need to be made. That is one reason why tonight we are content and happy. Because we know that we have the courage to build a new Labour Party take, capable of taking this country through to the new millennium. But there is a second reason too and a reason that I am very conscious of. That support that's been given to us tonight has been given to us as a new Labour Party. And it's been given to us so that we can bring our country together, so that we can unify it, so that we can put an end to divisions, so that we can build one country, one nation, one society, where every person gets a chance and a stake in it, where no one is left out. That is the message that we have taken round this country, and that is the message the country has heard and celebrated. Yeah. Yeah. Tony Blair then speaking at Sedgefield Labour Party. And it's a great thing, is it not, to think of people from all walks of life, all classes, all sections of society coming behind a party that wants to unify this country. A party that will govern this country, not on the basis of sectional interests or vested interests, not on the basis of paying off this deal or that deal, but on the basis of bringing this country together and giving it unity and purpose for the future. We can do that now. And I learned 
those simple lessons and values here in this constituency. Yeah. It's a strange thing to think as I look around this room and I see so many faces that I've known over all the years. So much good and decent and loyal support. And through all those bad and sad times in the Labour Party when we were trying to build this party into a modern party of the future, and sometimes it seemed difficult to do, but we persevered. And I was able to persevere because of the strength that you gave me. This is the foundation of my political life and career here in this constituency. And I cannot tell you what pleasure and pride it gives me to see so many people here whose loyal support and whose basic decency have made me what I am today. And my greatest pleasure will be to repay the trust that you've put in me. I believe in you, and I believe that you represent all the best in this country. And the greatest pride I could ever have is to repay that trust a thousandfold. Tony Blair then with his Labour Party supporters in Sedgefield in his constituency, the launch pad for his bid for the leadership and now his arrival at the top job at number 10 with the largest Labour majority ever, with his old friend and mentor John Burton, who got him the seat in the first place. Now, we've had some more results in. Uh, South London seats, which have gone to Labour. Wimbledon has been gained on a swing of 18%. Charles Goodson Wick, the doctor who went out to the Gulf War, defeated as the Conservative candidate there. Lady Olga Maitland, defeated in Sutton and Cheam on a swing no swing. Liberal Democrat takes that seat. Liberal Democrats gain in Sutton and Cheam. They had that seat before, of course, way back in a by-election. And Lady Olga Maitland defeated there. And a Liberal Democrat gain in Carshalton and Wallington. 2,000 majority. Nigel Foreman out. Liberal Democrats go in. At Sedgefield, in the Labour Club, there's applause for Tony Blair and a bit of singing. Rather thin singing, I think, there. Let's go back to the uh, results. A Labour gain in Middlesbrough South and Cleveland East on an 11% swing. Asha Kumar, who won it in a by-election, then lost it the general election to Michael Bates, wins it back. Gloucester, the seat that Labour made such a fuss about, which now seems to be just a minor seat in the mass of victories that Labour have, have uh, scored. This is the one they went to at the very beginning and they went to at the very end saying it was the key seat for them 58th in their target it needed a swing of 4.36 percent a paltry figure compared with the 11 percent they've actually got in gloucester douglas french out and tessa kingham takes the seat a journalist former teacher and oxfam worker croydon central is a labor gain david congdon loses croydon central swing of 15 percent Wright davis takes it Croydon North, a Labour gain. Malcolm Wicks takes that on a 19% swing. He had the seat before, wins it back. And the SNP gain in Tayside North. Bill Walker, staunch figure in the House of Commons from Scotland, Conservative, right-winger. And he's defeated there a Eurosceptic and vice-chairman of the Scottish Conservative Party. Shrewsbury and Atcham, Labour gain. Seat taken by Paul Marsden, comes up from third place. Liberal Democrats were in second place and they fall a little bit. Conservatives down and a swing from Conservative to Labour of 11% in Shrewsbury and Atcham. So the picture of the United Kingdom is changing fast as we speak, isn't it, Peter? 
Tony Blair has simply transformed the landscape. Even when you go back to the last Labour government of 1974, that is what Harold Wilson achieved in the October 74 election. You see the crescent of red there and quite a lot of uh, dotted uh, seats for Labour outside London, the home counties and so on. Now that changed, of course, by 1983, at the high watermark of Thatcherism, there were only two Labour seats outside London in the south of the whole of England. Look how blue that map was. Here's how it had changed. The Tories had come back. The Tories had completely swept to power, sweeping the Labour Party almost out of it, and the Liberal Democrats, true, did have 23 seats. But look how few other opposition seats there are there. Now, here we have the new pattern of colour on the country now. In 1997, it's completely transformed. I'm going to flash the changes since 1983 there so that you can see how Labour's comeback has been so much more spectacular than simply to return to October 74. This is Labour's best result ever. We've seen nothing like this in British history. And the Liberal Democrats, too, the best results since the 1930s. But Labour here with absolutely record-breaking success all over the country, in the home counties, in Surrey, down to the south coast there. The Midlands and the North almost entirely red, and of course Scotland now, a huge Labour stronghold with only one Tory seat visible up there in the North East. David. Thanks, Peter. Well, Emma Adwin is at uh, Cambridge and North West, and I gather Dr. Brian McWinnie, chairman of the party, has gone to ground, rather. Well, yes. The, his own result isn't expected for a long time, but Dr. McWinney is in the building. We understand he's spending a lot of time on the phone. He's talked to his central office and spoken to John Major this evening, I understand. But it is being made clear to us he isn't going to want to talk to the media probably this evening. Now, obviously, among his own friends, there's a deep concern that he's going to be made the scapegoat for these extraordinary results that we're seeing. And they're saying that that would be very unfair because one thing that has been clear throughout the campaign is that he has not had sole control of the campaign strategy. He's been chairing meetings at Conservative Central Office with Viscount Cranbourne from Number 10 and the Deputy Prime Minister Michael Heseltine there, and he's had to share the responsibility with them, and therefore his friends say he must share the blame with them as well. And there has been one really distinctive thing about the way he's run the campaign, which is that he's impressed on Central Office that they have to run a campaign that the Prime Minister would be happy with. Now, what that's meant in practice is that where some people would have liked more direct, more personal attacks on Tony Blair, John Major wasn't happy with that, thought it was inappropriate to his personality and to his office as Prime Minister, and Dr Mulwiney has backed him in that. Similarly, the Prime Minister has had his head over Europe. Now, some may say a different party chairman would have stood up to John Major and said, I'm sorry, Prime Minister, this isn't working. But what his friends say is that when the aftermath is examined, people are going to have to look at the last five years, not just the last five weeks. But surely, Emma, this is not a campaign that's gone astray. This is something much deeper than that, a result on this scale. I mean, he'll be saved by that, won't he? That, you know, no campaign could prevent a complete wipeout of a party. Well, exactly. I mean, I think what his friends are saying is you're going to have to look a lot further back. You're going to have to look at the divisions, as we've heard many people mentioning on this program. You're going to have to look at the way the party is handling the issue of Europe. But the fact of the matter is the party of the chairman has ultimate responsibility for a campaign, and that's something that Dr. Moore Winnie accepted right at the outset. goes with the territory, as okay. one of his friends said to me today. Emma, thanks very much indeed. Let's go to Brent North where, judging by his face, Dr. Rhodes Boyson has lost his seat. And that very Strachan Gardner has been duly elected to serve as a member of the said constituency. So Barry Gardner takes the seat from Sir Rhodes Boyson. Sir Rhodes Boyson has been the MP here since 1974. He's defeated. And we go up to Rushcliffe where well, Kenneth Clark is defending his seat for each the candidate of the Exchequer. At the said election is as follows. Boot Samuel, Liberal Democrat, 8,851. Chad Salary Catherine, the Referendum Party candidate, 2,682. 
I'll repeat that, 2,682. Clark Kenneth Harry, the Conservative Party candidate, 27,558. Mishevska Anna, Natural Law Party, 115. Moore Joseph Duncan, UK Independence Party, 403. Pettit Jocelyn, the Labour, the Labour Party candidate, 22,503. And I do hereby declare, I'll repeat that, and I do hereby declare that the said Kenneth Harry Clark is duly elected Member of Parliament for the said constituency. Thank you. Kenneth Clark holds his seat, his majority way down, a swing against him of 11%. 11 percent. 11 and a half, we showed as 12. Well, Mr. Returning Officer, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, firstly, I'm very grateful to the people of Rushcliffe for returning me to represent them again, which is a privilege I've had for 27 years, and I look forward to representing all of them to the best of my ability for another parliament which looks set to go well into the next century. Uh, for 18 of those years, I've had the pleasure of serving in government in many posts as a much reshuffled career. Uh, I'm extremely proud of what we've achieved in that 18 years, and I believe we can look back on a period of office in which we have transformed this country to make it a much more successful, self-confident and proud state. And I trust in the national interest that those who are now going to take responsibility for our affairs take good care of them and achieve success themselves. Uh, I particularly hope that in terms of jobs and prosperity and uh, growth of the economy, we do well. I also hope we continue to improve the quality of our public services and demonstrate to the world that the quality of life in this country is one of the finest that you can find anywhere, and uh, I hope they enhance what we have achieved over uh, our period of office. On this occasion, uh, when right, we are... Edinburgh facing... West, we have the declaration here. Edinburgh West, Lord James Douglas Hamilton for the Conservatives has been defeated here. The Liberal Democrats have taken the seat. Thank you. I would like to thank all the people involved in running the election for the hard work they have put in. It looks very much as though there won't be any Tories in Scotland at all, Peter. Nobody north of Hadrian's Wall for the Tory party. Right, the map was very blue before. There it is in 1992, the last Parliament. Quite a few Tories there, 11 last time. At least it seems a lot when you think of it, although 72 altogether, not very many. But there we have the map of Scotland as forecast now with not a sign of blue anywhere. The SNP taking seats from the Tories, the Labour Party taking seats from the Tories. We reckon it's 56 Labour. They, uh, the 50 they had before was the highest ever in history. Now they're on 56. They always get all the seats in Scotland. Up six. Liberal Democrats up two. The SNP six up nine. The Tories down 11. So here we have the story of Scotland then over the last uh, 40 years or so. Anthony Eden with 36 of Scotland's MPs, roughly half of them. Going down to Margaret Thatcher. 10, the lowest ever up to now, John Major 11 last time, and now the Tories with no MPs in Scotland at all. Records being created everywhere. Just look at this. There's the Duke of Wellington with the lowest Conservative vote in history, 29.4% up to now. 1832, the Duke of Wellington led his party's defeat to start for the Great Reform Bill. Ted Heath was uh, the worst this century with 36.7% uh, of the vote in October 1974. And here we have John Major now with 32.1%. A little bit better than the Duke of Wellington, but still worse than people like the Earl of Derby in the mid-50s in the last century. David. But the, uh, the, 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 Scottish, the Scottish Tories should vote for devolution, and at least they'll get a presence in the Edinburgh Parliament. Having been wiped out in the Westminster, I mean, wiped out in the Westminster. Indeed, Parliament. With, 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 with some share of the vote in Scotland, they would get some MPs. Well, in the, uh, in what's the their Parliament. share? What's their actual share of the vote in Scotland? Uh, very low, at about sort of seventeen percent. Yes, yeah, sort of we give, under PR, we give them a seat. Of or course. Two. Let's join Jane Frankie in Scotland. Jane. And I think there's as much as shock here as there is elsewhere, David, because the, these have been major scalps, major shocks. Top names so far, of course, Scottish Secretary Michael Forsyth 
and the president of the Board of Trade, Ian Lang. Now, Michael Forsyth was famous for his Houdini act in the past because he's escaped defeat so often, but it failed him tonight. And Sterling is now a Labour seat. So too is Eyre a Labour seat. That's the first time Eyre ever has been a Labour seat. Um, Eastwood, perhaps, was the one that gave people up here the most shock because Eastwood is always perhaps somewhat laughingly known as a little bit of Tory England in Scotland. It was undoubtedly the safest seat in Scotland, one of the safest in Britain altogether, and it's gone um, to, the Labour, to the Labour Party. Aberdeen South, again, has also gone to Labour. The Scottish Office Minister Raymond Robertson losing there. And Dumfries, the country's third safest seat, is now Labour. And they've lost Aberdeenshire West and Kincardineshire to the Liberal Democrats, Perth and, Ta Perth and Tayside North, of course, to the SNP and Galloway as well. Um, at the moment, we're waiting for one more Tory seat to declare up here. That's Malcolm Rifkin's seat in Edinburgh Pentlands, the Foreign Secretary's seat. Um, at the moment, it's not looking at all promising for him. If his seat goes, that will be, in fact, the last Tory seat in Scotland. Thanks very much, Jane. We hear that uh, Tony Marlowe, the blazed figure who supported John Redwood in the leadership campaign against John Major in 95, has lost his seat, Northampton North. And this was Ian Lang's result in Galloway and Upper Nisdale. Let's just have a look at it. The SNP take this seat. Ian Lang, Trade and Industry Secretary, is defeated there. And he's with John Nicholson now. John. Ian Lang, I mean, this is a disastrous night for the Conservatives, not just in the UK as a whole, but specifically in Scotland. Not a single Conservative seat in Scotland. I mean, what lessons do you read into that? Well, I haven't heard all the results yet, and I don't think you have either. But certainly it has been a bad night for us. We were trying to win a fifth successive term. No government has ever succeeded in doing that. Uh, and I think people did decide it was time for a change. But this is more than an ordinary protest vote against an unpopular government. I mean, if, if we're in a position in Scotland where there is not a single Conservative Member of Parliament, which now looks increasingly likely... Well, we I don't mean, yet know that, do we? Well, there are very few still to declare, as you know. The electorates clearly seem to be sending uh, the Conservatives a message. I mean, what message in Scotland do you think they're being sent? I think it's a United Kingdom message that they wanted a change of government. They were persuaded by the promises and pledges and high flown rhetoric of the Labour Party, now that party will have to deliver in government. It's always failed in the past, it'll probably fail again. But of course your own defeat wasn't at the hands of uh, the Labour Party, it was at the hands of the Scottish National Party, so there's something, uh, apart from the national picture, there's something specific going on in Scotland too. Yes, there's a rising tide and uh, in uh, most of the country it has gone to Labour, but in other parts of the country it has gone to the party most likely to beat uh, the government, and that is part of the pattern at the end of four parliaments. I mean, you, you were seen as a possible leadership contender, of course, after the this election, uh, obviously not in a position to contend for the leadership now. I mean, who, who would you like to see succeed, John Major? I'm not going to talk about that sort of issue tonight. Uh, would you would you have run had you still been in Parliament? I'm not going to talk about that either. That's a, hypo a, a hypothesis okay, on top of another let's hypothesis. Let's go to Mitchum and Morden, where we have the result of Dame Angela Rumbold's contest. 27,000. <laughs> Linda Miller, BNP 521. Angela Rumbold of the Labour has taken the seat and Dame Angela Rumbold has been defeated. Vice Chairman of the Party. Krishna Vassan, 144. Thomas Walsh, Green Party, 415. And I do hereby declare that Siobhan McDonough is duly elected Member of Parliament. So Dame Angela Rumbold is defeated. Now we get the declaration from Tatton. Ladies Martin and Bell gentlemen, on the left there in we white. We have the result now and for the Tatton constituency. Neil Hamilton defending for the Conservatives. I, Brian Longden, being the acting returning officer. And this, of course, the, the great contest of between the man in the, the white suit and the man with the cloud hanging the over his head of, of accusations of. Do improper conduct in the House of Commons. The number of votes recorded Sir for George each candidate. Downey, Sir Gordon Downey, rather, still to report on this. Follows. Martin Bell, independent. Twenty-nine thousand three hundred. Well, it's fairly clear that Martin Bell has won that seat, independent. 
Remember, Labour and Liberal Democrats stood down to let Mr. Bell contest this seat against Neil Hamilton. And 54 votes. David Lawrence Bishop, Lord 116 Barrow. votes. Mostyn Neil Hamilton, 18,000. A massive defeat for Neil Hamilton. 29,000 for Martin Bell, 18,000 for Neil Hamilton. 18,277 votes. Sam Hill, 295. Michael Paul Kennedy. Natural law. 123. Simon Lowther Kinsey. Independent. This was the fifth safest Conservative seat. Tatton. Neil Hamilton was under pressure, some thought, to stand down. The Prime Minister, right through this campaign, defended his decision not to try and have Neil Hamilton removed. There is the transvestite candidate, Miss Moneypenny. Standing from his money penny's Moneypenny's glorious party. Um, nothing like a little local difficulty votes. to attract a wide range of candidates. But anyway, Martin Bell went there. The Prime Minister right through Julian said, Sleaze wasn't an issue. This man was innocent until found guilty. The Tories were expected to rally round. The Tories quite clearly didn't rally round him. Martin and Martin Bell, Bell finds himself in the unexpected position as a man with Parliament, no particular political stance, no particular political views, except that he felt very strongly that standards in public life needed to be restored. And he's taken this seat. He was briefly a Liberal when he was at university. He's got a majority of 11,000. Here he is in the unexpected role of Member of Parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Longdon, uh, I believe this is a proud moment for the people of Tatton, though I have to say a rather humbling one for me. I did not do this. You did it. It was not my victory. It was your victory. Though maybe there was a time when I received the endorsement of Sir Alec Guinness that I knew the force was with us. I believe you have lit a beacon which will shed light in some dark corners and illuminate the mother of parliaments itself. It is a strong signal to the rest of the country which will be heeded. My thanks go to the returning officer and his staff, to the police, of course to my own staff, Kate Jones, my publisher and agent, Melissa, my daughter and spin doctor, Nigel Bateson, my former cameraman and close friend, to Kate Edgley, Dave Gein and, and many others. What you have accomplished here has been to me some kind of a political miracle. Uh, I shall be and shall remain independent. I shall take no party whip. I shall serve for one term only. I am deeply grateful to all of you. And may I just repeat for the last time a couple of lines from G.K. Chesterton that I used during the campaign. Smile at us, pay us, pass us, but do not quite forget that we are the people of England and we have not spoken yet. You have spoken tonight magnificently, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. There was Martin Bell. And now Neil Hamilton, the defeated Conservative candidate. Mr. Longdon, ladies and gentlemen, First of all, I would like to thank you, Mr. Longdon, for the exemplary way in which you customarily have carried out your functions this evening. And to the police and all those who have been responsible for maintaining the security of this building to enable this democratic process to be carried out to the full. And to all those who have been responsible for counting the votes and delivering them here this evening. I have been proud to represent the Tatton constituency for the last 14 years, and of course, am devastated at the result here this evening. I know it will come as a great disappointment to all those who have worked so hard to attempt to 
elect me for the fourth time as the Member of Parliament for this constituency. Edinburgh Pentlands now, where Malcolm Rifkind cast, is in difficulty. Foreign Secretary. Linda Margaret Clark, Scottish Labour Party, 19,675. <laughs> Jennifer Ann Dog, Scottish Liberal Democrat, 4,575. <laughs> Stuart Gibb, Scottish we National hear news Party. That Michael Portillo has lost his seat in Enfield by 1,700 votes. Charles Martin Harper, Scottish Green Party. So it looks as though it's Rifkin down and Portillo down. <laughs> Alistair David McConaughey, UK Independence Party, 81. 81. Malcolm MacDonald, Referendum Party, 422. <laughs> Malcolm Leslie Rifkin, Scottish Conservative and Unionist, 14,813. <laughs> and I declare that Linda Margaret Clark has been elected to serve in Parliament as a member for the Edinburgh Pentlands constituency. Well, she's a lawyer too, so she makes way at the Scottish Bar for Malcolm Rifkind, who's a Scottish lawyer. The Foreign Secretary defeated in Edinburgh Pentlands by Linda Clark. His majority of 5,000 turned into a majority for Labour of 5,000, a swing of 10% in Edinburgh Pentlands. Tonight, tonight is a historic occasion. Democracy in action is awesome. Today at the polling station, I met by chance an old lady who was almost blind and she was crippled, but she was determined to vote. And I'm so pleased that so many people all over Britain have voted today. I thank the voters in Pentlands in particular for voting and for so many of them voting for me. I thank this is Enfield North, the returning officer in the constituency held by My Michael Portillo, John Redwood at Wokingham. It may be that he is the only person on the right of the party left to challenge for the leadership if there is and when there is a leadership battle. Enfield North, again Michael Portillo's constituency, we're waiting for the declaration there. And uh, it looks as though it'll be a few minutes before we get that. So we have an extraordinary position of cabinet ministers falling fast. Hup, here is Michael Portillo. There he is down at Enfield North. Let's just have a look at him. Looking quite perturbed. Tony King, we're losing minister after minister after minister. What's the current tally? Absolutely. It looks as though there's going to be the, one of the biggest culls of ministers in this century. The uh, Conservatives in 1945 lost five members of the cabinet, including, it must be said, Harold Macmillan, who went on to do good things. It looks as though of all the ministers who are defending Tory seats tonight, two-thirds of them are likely to lose their seats. A lot have already gone. We've had Ian Lang, Michael Forsyth, Tom Sackville, Alistair Burt, John Bowes, Sir Nicholas Bonsor, they're going down like nine pins. Okay, thanks very much. Well, that's the way it crumbles. Jeremy. Just now. Um, Cecil Parkinson, who do you fancy for the leadership, assuming you don't have to go to the House of Lords? Well, I, I think that uh, we really have to wait and see about that. We have to see who's going to be there. Uh, and I just think it's far too early to discuss it. I really do. I simply don't okay. know who's going, who, are, who the candidates are likely to be. Now, Ian Duncan Smith, what, in your view, went wrong? I think it's very difficult. We'll have to look now uh, carefully and try and assess it. But my instinct tells me that uh, it all really started to go wrong for us in the first year when we crashed out of the ERM, because I think the British public then decided that we were no longer in charge of the economy at that stage. And if you look at the opinion polls, we went off the edge of a cliff at that point, and we've never really recovered through Maastricht, through all the difficulties, the fact that we had perhaps another right. year and a half of risk. Edwina Carey can join us, I believe. Uh, can you join us, Mrs Carey? Yes, indeed. Uh, in fact, I see behind you, um, I think that the Prime Minister's arriving in Huntington, so we'll just come back to you in just a second or two, if we may. 
Why do, you, why do you think John Major lost, Mrs. Curry? Well, we all lost, uh, and this is part of the tragedy. Uh, we've lost most of the cabinet, it sounds like, and all the seats in Scotland. I think in the end we lost because we did not satisfy the British people about our probity, about our wisdom, and about our common sense. Do you blame the Eurosceptics in particular? It's more than that. Uh, it's not just Eurosceptics. Uh, I think the British nation, whatever its dislike about Europe, has always broadly been pro-European. But uh, whatever their moans about education, whatever moans about the police and law and order, they've always been, as well, broadly pro-public service, especially in those services they can't provide for themselves. To share Ian Duncan Smith's view, we were just hearing him express there, that it all started to go wrong when you tumbled out of the ERM. Well, I, I'm, I like him very much indeed, but I'm reminded that he's one of the people that's been voting against the Prime Minister and voting against us uh, on a number of issues right through this Parliament. And that kind of uh, disunity and disagreement with the party line has not, in the end, been very helpful. I think it started before that, to be honest. We came in last time on the belief and the promise that we could keep taxes down, and that proved impossible. Well, Perhaps we should have realised it, but in the end, we put taxes up. The biggest peacetime hike well, in taxes we've ever seen, and the electorate um, right. didn't like Ian it. Right. Ian Duncan Smith, what do you think? Well, with respect to Edwina, I have to say that this really comes back to that fact, that we were in a recession longer than we anticipated, hence taxes went up because of the ERA and because it pegged us into a very depressed state. When we tumbled out, right. the British public said, enough. And I think that's our problem. We have to look at this carefully. It's not the only reason, but it's a very strong feature. All Let the polls show us that. Let's hear from George Gardner, who was one of the more troublesome uh, Conservative Eurosceptical back uh, bench MPs who's in Rygate waiting for his result. What do you think it was, Sir George? You've been predicting this for ages. Oh, yes. I mean, the irony is that if John Major had listened to the advice that I and others like Ian Duncan Smith uh, were giving him, oh, a year or so ago, uh, then we wouldn't have had the rout that we've clearly got this evening. Sir so George, do you think it was helpful to Mr Major's chances of winning that you described him as having his buttocks clenched on the fence? <laughs> I don't think it, uh, it affected the matter at all by then. I think the Tories had lost anyway. But Sir George, you were one of numerous people in your party who was setting out deliberately to undermine the Prime Minister. No, we weren't setting out to undermine the Prime Minister. We were setting out to get him to adopt some sensible policies that had some credibility with the electorate. Would it have made he a difference? Listen, in... Alas, it... and he's paying the price for that now. Would it have made we a... all are, all the Conservative Party are. Sure, although you're not part of it at present. But... I'm not part of it now. Indeed. No. Um, would it have made a difference if uh, Kenneth Clark had not had the influence he'd had? Oh, I'm sure it would, though... Uh... Uh, it, it's a question of degree, isn't it? I'm sure still the Tories would have lost. I, I tend to agree with Duncan Smith uh, that uh, really this slide began with the departure from the ERM or indeed sticking in the ERM for far too long. Cecil Parkinson, you've already told us that you think it was simply a question that you've been around so no, long. I, I think that was a major factor, not the only mm. thing, but I think really and truly it is a tremendous undertaking to try to win five consecutive elections uh, and I think uh, one, one always recognised that uh, and the Labour Party has reorganised right. itself, has regrouped, pr improving with each election since 79 uh, and sooner or later we were not going to win. But and there have been all sorts of other factors, as Ian's been pointing out. But I do think it would have been very difficult in any circumstances to win a fifth term. Now, what do you think about uh, Michael Portillo losing his seat? He was your PPS, wasn't he? Well, he was my special advisor, and then he was my number two in transport. I'm devastated. I think he's a quite outstanding politician. We should say we, we, the declaration hasn't actually happened yet, but the, yeah. the, the, the word but, is I mean, he's he was, He's been an excellent defence minister. He's very highly regarded in the department. He's had a very good election campaign come over well, and uh, I'm just extremely sorry. I think he's a most able person. Well, who knows? He might still, so, he he might still back. hold it. Um, Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, who will you now? You backed John Redwood, didn't you, when he challenged for the leadership? Yeah, at the leadership mm -hmm. challenge, yeah. Uh, he probably is <coughs> about the only Eurosceptic uh, left in a position to do so next time, I guess. I think we have to take stock. I don't think there's a chance to rush around. I think the Prime Minister has to think, uh, or the, as maybe the ex-Prime Minister John Major ought to think carefully about what he plans to do. Um, we don't want recriminations. What we actually want is carefully to analyse what's happened and try and rebuild this okay. party back into government. That's the key. Thank you all very much, David. Thanks, Jeremy. Well, um, John Redwood is having an emotional night, rushing around on the telephone and listening to all these results, and no doubt waiting to see uh, what happens to his potential rival for the leadership, Michael Portillo. He was 
there at his count in Wokingham, where he's been constantly on the telephone and being congratulated, looking rather moved by his wife, Gail. So, we've had uh, other results in which we should look at. Perhaps the most striking, Mrs Thatcher's old seat, Finchley, taken by Labour. John Marshall defeated on a swing of 15%. Hartley Booth, who was there, was deselected. He was one of the first victims of the Back to Basics campaign, which uh, the Prime Minister, perhaps with hindsight, rather ill-advisedly ran and found a number of his MPs falling out of the wrong beds swiftly afterwards. Ilford South, a Labour win. Sir Neil Thorne is defeated there, a 17% swing. He held it before, Mike Gapes takes it for Labour. Labour gain Hendon, a swing of 16%. Sir John Gorst, who fought a feisty campaign there, including denouncing the Tory party over the proposal to close Edgware Hospital after he'd been told, as he th thought, that it wouldn't be. 16% swing. So the scoreboard now stands at Labour 299, up 77. The Conservatives on 39, that's up nine, down 97. And the Liberal Democrats on 24, up 16. And we're about to get this result, which we've been waiting for, from Enfield Southgate, Michael Portillo's seat. There's the count. And Lance Price is there, and we're waiting for Mr. Portillo, who, after all, if he doesn't, if he had won this seat, would have certainly been one of the prime contenders. We heard him earlier this evening speaking loyally about the need for the party okay, to stick to together. And it now looks as though he may not have got it. Lance, are you there? Yes, I am. And uh, at the moment, just out of shot there, the returning officer is giving the results to the candidates, uh, to Michael Portillo, to Stephen Twig, his Labour opponent, who we understand, we believe, has won the seat. We can see Mr Portillo there now. Uh, once the returning officer has gone through the formalities of giving the result to them, they all knew the result uh, a few minutes earlier in any case, but this is the formal handing over of that result. They're now going up onto the podium for the declaration here in Enfield, South Korea. Well, this, is a, this Lance is a devastating blow for Mr Portillo if it is true that he's lost this seat because this was his one chance to take over the leadership of the Conservative Party and he's blown it by losing his own seat. It must be a really tough, uh, a tough moment for him. The look on his face as he's Thank been you, going round in the past few minutes before this uh, count has been extraordinary. He obviously side. knows that his chances of taking over now are very slim. For the Enfield, Southgate constituency held on the first day of May 1997, hereby give notice that the total number of votes recorded for each candidate at the election is as follows. Brown, Jeremy Richard, Liberal Democrat, 4,966. Luard, Nicholas Lamott, Referendum Party, 1,342. Malakuna, Andrew, Mal, Voice of the People, 229. Portillo, Michael Denzel, Xavier, thank you, ma'am. Conservative Party, 19,137. <laughs> Storkey, Alan James, Christian Democrat, 289. Twig, Stephen, Labour Party, 20,500. Well, look at the face of Gillian Shepherd listening to these results Thank coming you, through, watching the screen. And John ladies Redwood and in Wokingham. Please. Michael Portillo has lost the seat. Labour ladies celebrates at the Festival please. Hall as the Thatcher favourite, one of the bastards in the Cabinet, as John Major called him.
who was accused of plotting last time for the leadership, is defeated by young Stephen Twigg. Duly elected Member of Parliament for the constituency. And Michael Portillo has a swing of 17.5% against him. He took this seat in a by-election just after 83, took a seat in a by-election, which is not that easy to do when the Conservatives were in power, and has lost it at the general election on a swing of 17, nearly 17.5%. So that ends one challenger for the leadership of the Conservative Party. The Defence Secretary is out. along with result after result across the country, demonstrates that there is no longer such a thing as a no-go area for the Labour Party. Can I thank you, Mr Mayor, and the police and all of the others responsible for ensuring the smooth and efficient running of the count and the smooth and efficient running of the election process here in Enfield Southgate. Can I thank all of the other candidates? We've had a good campaign here. We've had no dirty tricks here. We've had an honest, open debate in the Enfield Southgate constituency, and that's welcome. And can I finally but most importantly thank two groups of people, First of all, my agent, Tony Watts, and the rest of the campaign team in Enfield Southgate, and those Labour supporters and members who came from outside Southgate to help, particularly over the last few weeks. And secondly, and most importantly of all, the 20,000 people who voted Labour in Southgate, those who voted Labour consistently through the difficult years as well as now through the good years for Labour, their loyalty and consistency has been repaid with this result. Thousands of first-time voters, thousands of people switching from other parties, especially the Conservatives, and certainly hundreds of Liberal Democrats who put aside their national preference, voted tactically for Labour to ensure a non-Conservative victory. I pay tribute to all of them, and I will serve as the Member of Parliament for all of them, and indeed for all of the people who didn't vote for me as well. It's a good night for Labour. It's a good night for the country. You've all been here a long time, so you probably don't want to hear much more from me. We've got a long night to celebrate in the weekend as well, but thanks a lot. Michael Portillo, very punctilious, applauding uh, his Mayor, opponent, who's just defeated uh, him here in My first duty is to congratulate Stephen Twigg on his victory and say that uh, no one knows better than I what a great privilege it is to be the Member of Parliament for Enfield Southgate. He'll enjoy it very much indeed. I think he'll be a very good Member of Parliament, and I wish him well with it. Uh, we're obviously also going to have a new government. Government has to represent this country and do its best, and I wish the new government well too. It has been a great privilege to serve, and I thank all those people who made it possible for me for 13 years. In this election campaign, I'd like to thank Malcolm Tyndall, I'd like to thank all my supporters and the Conservative Association that has supported me for all these years. A truly uh, terrible night for the Conservatives. Uh, I would have wished to have been part of rebuilding it inside the House of Commons. I can't now do that, but I would like to do whatever I can from the wings to help rebuild a great party which has a great future. One thing, one thing alone I will not miss, and that's all the questions about the leadership. Thank you very much. <laughs> Michael Portillo there, saying it's a terrible night for the Conservatives. At any rate, he doesn't have to answer questions about the leadership because he has been defeated and is out of the House of Commons. We're joined now by Gillian Shepherd, I hope, from Norfolk Southwest, the Education Secretary. Mrs. Shepherd, are you in trouble in your constituency? Well, they've only just started to count the votes, uh, but given tonight's swings, anything could happen. So you might well be defeated as well? Who could say? What do you make of the results so far? Well, clearly, as uh, Michael Portillo said, it's an enormously disappointing night for the government, for the Conservative Party. 
It's a particular blow that Michael has uh, so narrowly lost his seat. He will be enormously missed. And I so admired the typically graceful and elegant and indeed generous way uh, in which he just spoke. Do but you of have... course, he will be back. Do you have any idea why you've suffered this devastating defeat? Uh, well, uh, various theories have been put forward uh, on your programmes during the course of the evening. There is no doubt that when we think that the last Labour government was elected 23 years ago, uh, the electorate may well have thought it was time for a change. It is also certainly the case that the appearance that the parliamentary party has at times given over the past few years of being divided and of squabbling amongst themselves has not endeared us to the electorate. We've all had a lot of feedback, or I certainly have, from constituencies up and down the country and from my own, uh, of people who feel very critical of the parliamentary party, which has at times appeared to be concerned with its own internal politics rather than the Conservative Party in the country at large. So did, did you know even before yesterday that the game was up? No, I think most people would have said, and it was certainly uh, what I found, that the reception on the doorsteps was uh, uniformly uh, positive and pleasant. However, uh, clearly what we were all doing was merely sampling uh, opinion, and it is indeed um, a big night for the Labour Party uh, and uh, a big night for the government of this country. Thank you very much, Mrs Shepherd. Thank you. And we'll hear your result. When do you expect your result to come through? Oh, lot, many hours to come. Many hours? Oh, many hours. What, tomorrow yes. morning? I shouldn't worry about it if I were you. No, no, <laughs> we'll be watching very, very closely. Thank you very much, okay. Jeremy. Okay, bye. David. Uh, Margaret Hodge, Stephen Twigg, who unseated Michael Portillo, you're not going to pretend you expected him to do that? No, I don't think we did expect him to do so. I know him very well. He was my researcher until he very recently took up the secretaryship of the Fabian Society. And uh, in fact, it was a condition of his taking the job at the Fabian Society that he wouldn't then stand for Parliament. We knew he, was, we knew he had this seat that he was going for, but at that point, it seemed most unlikely that he'd win, he'd win it. It just shows the extent of uh, the Conservative defeat. OK, sloganising apart and point scoring apart, what is your explanation for what's happening tonight? I think it's, well, it's a number of things. I mean, I do think it is a final comment or a judgment on the Conservative government. I have to say it's the sleaze, it's the arrogance, it's the years of, of power. It is actually uh, se seeming to work in their own interest rather than everybody's interest. So there's all that sort of anti-conservative feeling which has finally borne fruit. And it's borne fruit because Labour has renewed itself. We are a new Labour Party. I think Tony Blair has done the most fantastic job in a very, very short period of time to really renew and regenerate the Labour Party so that it is in tune with the values of people today. Um, Ian Duncan Smith, you're a neighbour of, uh, of, of, of Michael Portillo. Does, does any of that ring any kind of chord with you at all? Because the discussion among Conservatives we've been having here so far has been all about you losing it rather than Labour winning it. Yeah, I think that uh, in Michael's case there were some demographic changes, so there were some other problems, but no, nobody expected Michael to lose his seat. I must also say that uh, no, nothing befits him so well as the manner of his passing. I thought the, the speech today was gracious and showed great character, so, and I know he'll be back. It's just a matter of when. Uh, there is no explanation at the moment other than that the public has decided that they wanted a change. And I don't, uh, we'll have to decide what those reasons are, but there was a definite, they want a change. I don't think it was an overwhelming vote, I still don't think, for Labour. I think it was really a vote at the moment, devastatingly against us. Uh, Margaret Hodge, a uh, forecast majority of 187. You're looking at probably, I'm so sorry, I've got to stop there. We've got to David. Jeremy, thank you very much. We go to Stevenage. Pro-Life Alliance, 196. You've got a result One from Stevenage. Callcraft, Andrew Brindley Michael, Natural Law Party, 110. 110. Coburn, Geoffrey Michael, the Referendum Party candidate, 1,194. One, one, nine, four. Follett, 
Daphne Barbara, the Labour Party candidate, 28,440. Now, a huge outburst of uh, support for Barbara Follett as she takes Stevenage from the Conservatives. High on Labour's target, this 37. eight four four zero. Wilcock, Alexander Ian Cameron, Liberal Democrat, 4,588, 4588. Wood, Timothy John Rogerson, the Conservative Party candidate, 16,858. <laughs> 16858. And that the said Daphne Barbara Follett has been duly elected to serve as member for the Stevenage constituency. So Barbara Follett takes that and we go down to Bristol West. William Waldegrave. Referendum Party. And at this point we can say Labour has an overall majority, the 330 it needs. It's going to go way beyond that, of course, but it's got the 330 that it Charles needs, Boney, and there's William Aldergrave, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, looking rather gloomy on the right there. <laughs> Jonathan Aitken has lost Thanet South. Thanet, incidentally, the seat that Cherie Blair stood for in 1983, Brearley, when Natural Jonathan Aitken held it for the Conservatives. 47. Valerie David Davy, Labour Party, 22,000. So William Walgrave defeated in Bristol West. His majority of 9,000 overturned. Majority of 9,000 overturned. And uh, Valerie David moves up from third place to take that seat. So we now have Labour heading for a vast majority. They've just passed the 330 mark, which gives them the certainty of being in government, but it's going to be much bigger than that, isn't it, Peter? Here's how Tony Blair has changed the history of the country for the last two decades. 1979, Mrs. Thatcher beat Jim Callaghan. Miss... David? Now there's the Piccadilly Circus flashing on the screen there, the Labour victory. And um, it'd be nice to see if there are any crowds there watching that, but perhaps there aren't. But John Major in Huntingdon hearing that result and knowing that all is up, he's at his count in Huntingdon. Peter, I'm sorry we <laughs> interrupted you at the end of an era. Well, I don't think we can do better than Piggly Circus, but here we go anyway. Here's Mrs. Thatcher in uh, 1979 beating Jim Callaghan, beginning the 18 years of Conservative rule. She did it again, if you remember, with that huge majority of 144 in 83. That was the high watermark of Conservative success. Then the third one, uh, a little bit less, but still a convincing majority in 1987. Then John Major, the many people surprised, won the uh, election of 1992, the last one with a majority of 21, and now, that's all changed. The era of Conservative rule is over. There is Mr Blair with the most convincing majority, 187, a record Labour majority, bigger than any other majority since the war. He's got a larger lead over the Conservatives than any Labour party's had before, and the Tories are way down there with the worst share of the vote since 1832. It's a staggering Labour victory and the end of an era of British history. Thank you very much, Peter. Well, there's the result flashing over Piccadilly Circus. And as it does, we go down to find out what is going to happen in Wokingham to John Redwood. Gentlemen. He's won the seat. The glad about news to speak. of Conservative victory in Wokingham is, of course, tinged with sadness about the national result for all Conservatives. I am delighted that half of the electors of this constituency have put their trust again in me in the ballot box today. I will work hard on their behalf and on behalf of all my constituents, whatever they voted in this election. And I promise to all those constituents that I will faithfully perform my duties to the best of my abilities in the interests of the whole constituency. I would tonight like to thank all the returning officers' staff for the excellent work they've done. 
making sure that the local authority ballots don't get mixed up with the parliamentary and coming to a, such an excellent answer when they came to their counted conclusion. I would like to thank all the security staff and all the staff involved in this leisure centre for making it available tonight for this important night of our local democracy. I would like to pay a tribute to all the candidates in this election. I think we had a decent battle over the major issues. I certainly enjoyed putting the case across. I certainly enjoyed listening to what people had to say. And yes, we do need better schools. Yes, we do need to modernize our local hospital. And yes, we do need to make sure that Britain gets a good deal in Europe. Those were the messages from the doorsteps. Those are the messages I have clearly understood. Those are the messages that will carry me through this next parliamentary term. So thank you all. Thank you for an excellent result and an excellent contest. And I look forward to the next five years making sure that Wokingham has a strong and good voice in the House of Commons. John Redwood speaking at his count. And it does now look as though there are going to be no Tory MPs outside England. It's uh, one Welsh seat they might hold, but we think they've lost it, which is Brecon and Radnor. That means there will be no Conservatives at all in Wales or in Scotland. Jeremy. David, well, I'm joined now from his count by Michael Portillo, who's just lost his seat there. Uh, when you were here at the start of this programme, Mr Portillo, you didn't look like a man who knew he was going to lose, did you? I didn't know it, but I thought it was possible. Yeah. Why? Because there was obviously a very big swing underway. And now, what do you attribute that to? Um, I really don't know. I think, as I said to you earlier, that that needs quite a bit of uh, thinking out. Um, what I would say, I, re I said it earlier, was that the party was uh, pretty divided. And what I say now, for the first time I can speak without anyone suspecting me of having leadership ambitions or speaking to further my own uh, ambitions, I can now say that I plead with the party not to fall into disunity and opposition because that would be the way of staying there. Do you regret that you didn't stand for the leadership yourself? Uh, no, I don't actually. I, I thought uh, John Major was the right man to carry the leadership of the party. Um, and now it is, uh, it's come to what we see today. Uh, and I will do what I can to work from the outside to rebuild what is a great party. How can the party unite around the present policy on the single currency? Well, I'm now a man outside the House of Commons, so I don't have to bother with questions like that. I thought you just told the people at your declaration that you were going to work as in any capacity you could to further the party. Jeremy, I'm taking an evening off. Listen, I will do what I can to bring unity to the party, but I'm going to do it by talking to the party, not by talking to you. Sure, but it follows from that, doesn't it, that you believe you cannot have unity around the present policy? Uh, it follows from that that the party needs to reflect very carefully about how it's going to move forward. Uh, and I very much hope that it will be united. Uh, and as I say, since I clearly have no axe to grind in this matter, I hope that my words may carry some weight in that respect. Is the present policy the right policy? Oh, Jeremy, do stop this nonsense. <laughs> well, I think we'll have to stop the interview unless you've got anything else you particularly want to tell us this evening. It was you who wanted the you interview. You do. This is your last opportunity, Mr. Portillo. Oh, not necessarily. We you seem see. very good humour for a chap who's lost his seat and his chance of leading the party. Well, I think it's, uh, it's inherent in politics that you have to be prepared for ups and downs. OK. Mr. Portillo, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks David. very much. We go straight to Exeter for the declaration. <laughs> Looks as though Bren Ben Bradshaw has taken it for Labour. A very bitterly fought campaign between the Tory, Dr. Adrian Rogers, right-winger, and Ben Bradshaw, who uh, openly homosexual and a lot of propaganda against him from Dr. Adrian Rogers during the campaign itself. Paul Anthony Edwards. Green Party. 643. <laughs> Corinne Patricia Haynes. Independence. 638. James Kenneth Meekin. Pensioners. 282. David John Morrish. Liberal. 2062. 
Adrian Rudd Rogers, Conservative, 17,693. That Benjamin Peter James Bradshaw has been duly elected to serve as Member of Parliament for this constituency. So this is the seat that was held by the Tories by Sir John Hannam, and he's been defeated. He shakes hands even with the Conservative who made such bitter attacks on him. They both shake hands, like the unexpected moment that. The swing of 12% from Conservative to Labour. And Ben Bradshaw, former BBC reporter, becomes an MP. It's a historic night for Britain. It's a doubly historic night for Exeter. Because the people here have not just rejected the Conservatives and chosen Labour. They've rejected fear and chosen hope. And they have rejected bigotry and chosen... And for that, I want to thank them from the depths of my heart. I'd also like to thank the returning officer, all his polling station staff, the counters here in the hall, and the police. I'd like to thank the candidates from the Green Party, the old Liberal Party, the UK Independence Party, and the Pensioners Party for their clean and honourable campaign. I'd like to thank my wonderful family and friends and my Huntingdon, partner, where the Prime Minister's declaration is about to come through. The very safe Conservative seat. It used to be the safest, but Alan Clark in Kensington and Chelsea now has the safest Conservative seat. Prime Minister's seat has slipped a bit down the list, but still a majority of 22,000 at the last election. So he should be have no problems with holding that. Here he comes into the hall with Norma Major, the Prime Minister who's remained extraordinarily good humoured throughout this campaign despite the vicissitudes of the fight. He travelled around early morning till late at night and even when challenged at press conferences and in interviews and all the rest of it has always remained smiling with a Almost, some people said it was though he was freed by the campaign, but he certainly looked as if he was enjoying the campaign. And what he will do now is very uncertain. We shall have to wait to see whether we get from him tonight an acceptance of defeat or whether he waits until tomorrow, and then we have to discover whether he stands down, as must seem probable, from uh, the leadership of his party. And that will be read to you by the High Sheriff of Cambridgeshire, Mr David Rampley. I, David Temple Rampley, being the returning officer for the Huntington constituency, hereby give notice that the total number of votes given for each candidate at the election was as follows. David James Bellamy, 3,114. Charles Raymond Coyne, 331. Veronica Hufford, 177. John Major, 31,501. Matthew James Owen, 8,390. Jason Reese, 13,361. Duncan John Robertson, 89. And that John Major has been duly elected to serve as a member for the Huntingdon constituency.
Mr. High Sheriff. I'd first like, uh, if I may, to congratulate all those who've carried out the uh, count of this very large constituency with uh, such skill and with such speed. I'd also add my thanks to all those who cared for the security of the polling booths throughout the day and manned them. It is a job that has been done, as we have come to expect in Huntingdon, with immense efficiency. And I'm very grateful to everyone who played their part in carrying that out today. I'd like also, if I may, to thank my fellow candidates in this constituency. I have been something of an absentee candidate, at least in the Huntingdon constituency, but I understand that the battle here has been fought with great courtesy and uh, great skill. And I congratulate all those who've played a part in the campaign. I'm sure they will look forward to their future campaigns. I'd like also, if I may, to thank a number of people to whom I owe almost more than it's possible to express uh, readily and easily. Perhaps I may start with my agent, Peter Brown, a peer amongst agents. <laughs> Not only my agent, but a very old and dear friend, and I'm very grateful to him for all he has done, not just during this uh, campaign, but during recent years when he's perhaps had to undertake many burdens that perhaps would not normally have fallen upon the shoulders of anyone's agent. I'd like to thank also my constituency officers and the literally thousands of people who've worked in this constituency on my behalf during this campaign and over recent years. Their work has been immense. The affection I have for this constituency is not uh, easily expressed, but I think it is known by those people who live in the constituency, and I'm deeply privileged to have the opportunity of representing it yet again. Huntingdonshire has only had two members of parliament since 1945. I uh, have just been elected for the fifth time in this constituency, and I look forward with the same pleasure at serving my constituents in the future as I have found in doing so in the past. Above all, though, I'd like to express my thanks to Norma and to my family. Perhaps, perhaps these things are most appropriately expressed in private, but I think most people who have known Norma, most people who have seen her, will realize that not only has she graced this constituency for 18 years, I think she has graced a much larger stage in recent years, and my debt to her. And my, and my debt to her is one not easily paid. It is perfectly clear now that the Labour Party has had an extremely successful evening. I telephoned Mr Blair a little over an hour ago to congratulate him on his success and to wish him every good fortune in the great responsibilities that he will have in the years that lie ahead. This is a great country. He inherits a country in extremely good economic shape. I wish him every success in sustaining that in the interests of all the people of this country. I think I can promise that the Conservative Party will be a vigorous opposition. Where it is appropriate to support, we will support. Where it is in the interests of the country to support, we will support. Where we believe the policies are wrong, we will oppose vigorously, but honestly and fairly. But all that, I think, lies ahead for another day. For today, let me perhaps just add one further thought. Elections always have winners, and they always have losers. It is a very great occasion to win an election, a very great occasion to be elected to Parliament. Many colleagues and old friends of mine will have contested seats tonight and lost them. Uh, many colleagues will have contested seats on behalf of my party this evening, contested them well and bravely, but lost them. I would like, if I may, to express to all of them uh, my thanks for all they've done on behalf of our country and our party, and my thanks also to the literally hundreds of thousands of people who have helped in the Conservative Party campaign and the millions of our fellow citizens who voted for the Conservative Party on this occasion. We are a great and historic party, the Conservative Party. We have had great victories in our time, we have had defeats in our time. We 
accept them both, I hope, with a certain dignity and a certain grace. Tonight, we have been comprehensively defeated. We will listen to the voice of the electorate. We will consider what has been said to us. I think we must reflect upon it. I know that we will. And I know when we have reflected, we will begin to prepare once again for that day in the future, I hope not too far distant, when my party may once again return to government in the service of this country. Thank you. John Major saying that he rang Tony Blair an hour ago and congratulated him on his victory and wished I him well. Must be the happiest and uh, paying a tribute to Norma Major, who actually during this campaign has been very popular going around with him. People have been asking to speak to her rather than him, according to reports, during the campaigning has been uh, a great support to him. Now we're joined for the second time tonight by Michael Heseltine, who's in Henley. Mr. Heseltine, when we talked before, we were talking and flirting with the idea, as so often in interviews with you, about the leadership of the Conservative Party. There's nothing much left to lead tonight, is there? Well, I think that there is always something to lead if you are a member of the Conservative Party, because it is a party, as you well know and everyone knows, with a huge tradition, made a massive contribution to this country, and with an instinct for government. I have not the slightest doubt that the battle will begun be to fight back, and uh, that will be the instinct of the Conservative Party, particularly as uh, the arguments we put forward, the achievements to our credit, will stand the test of time. It's not tonight to refight the, the election campaign. But just because you lose the votes, it doesn't mean to say you've changed your mind about the arguments that you deployed. And I think you've heard John Major spell that out very clearly on behalf of the party in the interview that he's just given. Are there any, is there any one of your cabinet colleagues that you're particularly sad to have lost tonight? Well, it's a shattering situation to see people like uh, Michael Portillo and Malcolm Rifkin and uh, Ian Lang and uh, uh, Michael Forsyth, just to name the names immediately that come to mind, who have served uh, this country, uh, the, the government of which they're a member, uh, the Conservative Party, in such a remarkably skilled and dedicated way, lose their seats. Uh, one is uh, quite devastated by what has happened there. But I think <laughs> there's just one other thought. Uh, they'll be back. But what do you say to those Tories who remain, the 160-odd that are going to be in the House of Commons and to your supporters around the country, about what happens now? Is it going to be led by somebody like yourself who can bring the party back together again or thinks they can? Well, I think that it will be led by John Major. And you really? Uh, yes, I do. I think you that, don't think uh, he's going to stand down? I don't see any indication of that. And I believe that uh, uh, in the interview he gave, he was giving you the, uh, certainly the impression I got that uh, uh, conversations would take place, discussions and analysis, uh, in which he was intending to play a full part. And I'm sure that everybody would welcome that. What is your reaction to the defeat of Neil Hamilton in Tatton? Uh, well, I think that that's best left for the history books. Why do you say that? Because I don't see why you think I should comment on something like that, which is for Neil a personal tragedy. It's happened. Uh, you can have a judgment, I can have a judgment, but I'm not going to be drawn on that. I feel sorry for the man and for his wife in these circumstances. Do you think it was one of the factors that made it difficult for the Tories tonight or, or an irrelevancy? Well, I think that uh, there is an argument which I would subscribe to, that there were incidents in a number of cases in uh, the last parliament which uh, it's very difficult to think of a prime minister who has uh, had so many examples of bad luck quite outside his own control as those that uh, affected John Major. Mr. Heseltine, thank you very much. Thank you. Jeremy. I'm joined now by Sir Edward Heath from his county of Bexley and Sidcup. Um, Sir Edward, what do you judge went wrong? In the whole of the election campaign? Yes. Well, I think it goes much further back than that. And uh, it shows that in some cases we were out of touch with people. And we were also pursuing policies which they didn't accept. Specifically which? Well, I think myself that to put forward a complicated pension scheme a fortnight before the campaign began was unwise. Uh, it's difficult for people to understand, 
and they immediately became worried about it, as elderly people do tend to be. And so that was uh, an action which didn't need to be taken at that particular time and could have been held back. How much do you think there was a question of lack of confidence in the leadership ability of the Prime Minister? I mean, you said he should have sacked those ministers who questioned the government line. Uh, I would have preferred him to have done that. When and the same applies to the questions which arose over, quote, sleaze quotes. Hamilton should never have stood at this election. Do you think now that Mr. Major can continue as leader of a party that's divided from top to toe as yours is? No, our job now is to review very thoroughly the present situation and how it's developed. We had to do this in 1945, directly after the defeat of the party after the war. We had to do it in 1964. We'd had 13 years in power. And uh, Alec Douglas Hume told me to organize a complete review, which we did. And we said, this isn't just to justify what we've done in the past. What we've got to do is look quite impartially at it and say, well, was what we did justified? And was it successful or not? And if it wasn't, then scrap it and uh, think out new policies to deal with the present situation. So you're saying right back to the drawing board? Yes, absolutely. That doesn't mean to say that you will scrap everything which we've had in the past, but you will analyse it very carefully and decide whether it's right to continue with it. Sir Edward, thank you very much. David. Well, uh, Peter, perhaps we should have a look now at how Labour is doing. They've almost scored every hit they needed, haven't they? I, and I, more. Well, I think one or two exceptions. But the devastating thing about this Labour victory is the way they've hit so effectively uh, in the areas that they needed to do it in. I mean, up in the Scottish and the North areas and the, and the Wales and so on, the swing has been nothing like as big as it has been down in this devastatingly important area to them in the south where all those Tory marginals are 14 percent I mean it's a record-breaking swing by any standard since the war 14 percent swing in the south and in London uh, 11 percent there uh, in places like the Midlands and the result of that is that when we look at our targets and we see how well Tony Blair's party's aim has been it is absolutely devastating particularly in these clusters down here still a few results to come let me just uh, Lose, lose the ones that haven't yet been declared. You can see there, these are the safer, uh, these were the safer Tory seats, so seats like Portsmouth North uh, here and, for example, Dumfries in Scotland, and these ones, like uh, the Vale of Glamorgan, were very unsafe, very small Tory majority before. Now, as we fly around, uh, watch the hits here clocking up in the little hit box. The first one we're going for is Plymouth Sutton, then Exeter, you can see just beyond it there. There goes Exeter. Here comes Portsmouth North, the most difficult of those targets to hit. You can just see Simon Hughes surviving in the middle of London, but surrounded by those great skyscrapers of red in London. So one Liberal Democrat survives, uh, but otherwise just devastation everywhere. And huge Labour majorities building up where those powerful Tory majorities were before. Sterling in uh, Scotland, Michael Forsyth seat going up there, the last one. And you can see there that, yes, the uh, Welsh nationalists have survived in Ceredigion, uh, and also Simon Hughes, of course, uh, in London. But otherwise, it's going to be 98 hits on that target and two misses only. David. Thanks, Peter. Uh, not all Tory ministers have, um, have uh, taken the, the plunge tonight or walked the plank. Folkestone and Hythe, for instance, Michael Howard with a split opposition from Liberal Democrats and Labour held on there, 20,000 for him, 13, 14,000 for the Liberal Democrats. Uh, John Aspinall, incidentally, the zookeeper, who's the referendum candidate there, doing rather well, getting 8% of the vote in Folkestone and Hythe, but the Home Secretary holds it, 6,000 majority. Not quite yet the former Home Secretary. Hitchin and Harpenden, Peter Lilly, Secretary of State for Social Security. He gets a very big swing against him, but it's a safe seat. 15% swing against Peter Lilly, but he holds on to the seat. Uh, Fergus Walsh is in Charnwood, Stephen Dorrell's seat. We haven't yet had his declaration, but Fergus, what's your impression of how he's reacting to the news? First of all, of the disappearance of one or two of the potential rivals, and second, what kind of party it is there left to lead? Well, sources very close to Mr Dorrell are saying there should be a leadership election in July, that Mr Major should carry on for the moment, signal his intention to stand down, but hold on to give time to regroup, to give time for people to discuss what went wrong. 
Um, there are Tory party rules which say that after a general election, there should be, uh, if there is a leadership election, not before three months and not after six months. And uh, sources close to Mr. Dorrell say it would be within the spirit of that to hold a leadership election in July. Well, now, why do you think he wants that? Does he see that as an advantage to him and, uh, and, and not to his rivals? Absolutely, because it would give him time to uh, group his supporters together. Of course, Mr. Redwood's been out of the cabinet for some time now, so his, his bandwagon will roll pretty quickly. Um, but Mr. Dorrell is saying also, or Ms. Dorrell's sources rather, are saying that uh, what we need to do is analyse here what went wrong, why the message went so badly wrong on the doorstep. And uh, Mr. Dorrell's sources are saying that there were really three major factors that went wrong here. First, the time for a change. Nothing really they could do about that. Secondly, continuing hurt from the recession. And thirdly, the mixed up message on Europe. Fergus, thanks very much indeed. We just uh, have heard that the Prime Minister is going to Buckingham Palace at 11.30 in the morning. Our cameras will be there. We'll be following it, of course, um, to uh, hand in his resignation. Uh, and Tony Blair will follow within the half hour or so. By midday, we shall have a new Prime Minister. Uh, Anne Perkins is uh, with, uh, at John Redwood's count and has been talking to him. Let's hear from John Redwood, who won his seat in Wokingham. Well, I'm joined now by John Redwood, who's uh, swing against whom was only 6%, a good deal less than the national average. But you said two years ago, no change, no chance nationally. Do you think you've been proved right? Well, I take no comfort in that. Uh, I was worried two years ago that we would not win the next general election, and I did think then changes were necessary. Uh, but I'm just very pleased that the wo voters of Wokingham have backed me again for another parliament. I'm very pleased that about half of them did support me. Obviously disappointed, I've lost the support of some of them, and I will just work very hard over the next five years to try and win them over. You've also lost an awful lot of your friends in Parliament, an awful lot of people have gone. Why? Why is this result so bad for the Conservatives? It is a very sad night indeed for the Conservative Party. And yes, I'm very upset for a lot of my friends in Parliament who served their constituents very well, who with their colleagues have worked very hard in this election campaign and will no longer be able to serve in the next Parliament. Okay. I don't think it's time yet for explanations. Tonight is about results. It's about finding out who has won and who has lost. But you must have a gut instinct about what was wrong with the way the campaign was being fought. Well, I want to look at the overall results yeah. in the light of morning and think what would be right to say. I don't think it's sensible to rush off tonight with all sorts of explanations when the party is obviously extremely upset by the results and when we need to pull together and when we need to rebuild ourselves as a decent force in opposition. But can you not put your finger, I mean, you here ran a, a, a campaign focused very tightly on, on education, on health, on Europe. Mm. Uh, did, surely you could say whether or not you feel those were the issues that should have been hit nationally. Well, they were right for my campaign here uh, because we do seem to have had less severe a swing against us. And we did feel that people were very interested in those three big issues, health, education and Europe. And that on health and education, they needed reassuring that we were going to spend enough in the future, that we had been making changes for the better. And on Europe, they wanted reassuring that we were not going to take them into a federal superstate. Uh, with a Blair-led government, it will now be tr most important for Conservatives to make sure that Mr Blair does not give away powers to govern this country that we will need in the future. Do you think John Major can survive this result? I'm not commenting on anything like that. Uh, John Major is the leader of the Conservative Party and you should allow him time to consider what is best for the Conservative Party. Do you think leadership talk during the campaign damaged the campaigning effort? I have no further comments on the campaign. Uh, I'm just very pleased that in Wokingham people have backed me again and I will work very hard over the next five years to earn their trust. Anne Perkins with John Redwood. And now it's time to hear again from our roving reporter at large, Frank Skinner. Hello, I'm at the Thursday night dance at Podsey Civic Hall in West Yorkshire. And look at this, Tony's Tipple. They are for any Labour supporters who are here tonight. And there's a picture of um, Sarah Brighton for some strange reason. But there's a slogan on the side, look, Labour's coming home. Just a clever slogan. I wonder where they got that idea. So I'm just going to ask a couple of dancers. Hello. Uh, evening. Hello. Now, I don't know if you've heard the news, because you've been dancing all night, I imagine. Yeah. Um, apparently, Labour are doing quite well. Keep moving. It's all right. I can stick with you. <laughs> um, yes. Oh. Is that good news? Is it, is, is, is it unfortunate? Very. Very. For us. Yeah. Right. So you, you, be, you voted Conservative, I yes. take it. Right. OK. Well, it's not definite yet. I mean, you still, you know, live in hope. 
So what do you think of Mr. Blair? He's okay, it's his understudy that's the problem. Right. Mr. Prescott. Oh yeah, you don't like him. Oh, bloody does. <laughs> can he not dance? Fun? I don't know if he can or not. I've noticed that neither manifesto mentioned come dancing, whether that was going to keep going or not. So <laughs> that wasn't very good, was no, it? Wasn't. So basically you're more Lionel Blair than Tony Blair, is that fair? <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, okay, thanks. Nice to talk to you. Hello? Hello. You're right. Yes, sir. Now um I don't know if you've heard any news, but the, the prediction is that um Labour might well get in tomorrow. Is that good news? No. Yeah. It's for me. It's for me. Oh, it's a bit of a bit of a split. Oh dear. Yeah. Are you are you married? No. We were. Oh, right. Oh, well, you didn't split up over politics, I hope. Did no, you? no, we did, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, no. <laughs> Couldn't no, even didn't. agree on that. No, we didn't. No, no. No, we so, uh, no. what, what do you think of Mr. Blair? I think he's a nice guy. I, you know, I think he's a nice guy. Nice enough guy and everything, but... Um, I don't think he'd make a good Prime Minister. No. no. He'd have made a good ballroom dancer, wouldn't he? Because he's got that fixed smile yeah, that ballroom yeah. dancer... You know he's that? He's very nice. He's very nice, <laughs> cheeky. Yeah. Oh, he's cheeky. Cheeky smile, yeah. But we need a cheeky Prime Minister, don't you think, Do you for think a change? Because so? John's, he's a nice bloke, John, but he's not cheeky. No, he yeah. is. They're all the same. Yeah. Are they? Yeah, no. they, they say what they want to think. Yeah, I suppose you're right. They say what, right. We, what we want to think, you know. Yes. And then you change your mind. Yes. I think you. That's Anyhow. so true. Anyway, yeah. don't let me stop you dancing, and thanks, yeah. thanks a lot. Okay. Okay, Thank cheers. You. So there you are. The public of Podsey have spoken. Frank Skinner, they're reporting, and uh, he'll be back later on. He's wearing around the country tonight. Now, let's come back to the business in hand. Some Labour gains, first of all, Thanet South. Jonathan Aitken, who resigned as Chief Secretary of the Treasury so that he could pursue a legal action against the Guardian, has been defeated in, Than in Thanet South, it's a little difficult to say that, isn't it, by 15% swing. Richmond Park. A Liberal Democrat gain, Jeremy Hanley defeated. This is Richmond in Surrey, it's been renamed Richmond Park. The Liberal Democrats have been hankering for that seat for a long time, and Jennifer Tong takes it from the junior minister, briefly chairman of the Conservative Party, Jeremy Hanley. Hastings and Rye, a Labour gain. They come from third place to top place. Jackie Late defeated, she's been there since 92. First woman whip for the Tory party. Labour gains St Albans. A swing there of 15%. David Rutley defeated and Kerry Pollard again coming up from third position and Tory and Liberal Democrat 4-1. So again a good night for Labour in St Albans. The state of parties now, let's just have a look at that. Just coming up to 10 to 4. And we've had 505 results in, 373 Labour, well past the 330 seats they needed for an overall majority in the new House, up 123 so far. The Conservatives hanging way back on 90, down 146. The Liberal Democrats on 31, up 19, and they're doing well tonight. National parties up three, others up one. And the forecast, based on those... 506 results now with 153 to come, a new house of 659 in all, a Labour majority of 187, the biggest ever Labour majority. It's hard to see how they're all going to fit onto the government benches in the House of Commons. Peter Snow will no doubt be demonstrating for us soon how difficult it will be. Conservatives are heading for the lowest seats total since 1906. Liberal Democrats predicted to achieve their best third party results since 1929. Here are some of the key losers tonight. One of the people who hope to challenge for the leadership of the party, perhaps, Michael Bultillo, the Defence Secretary, defeated. Malcolm Rifkin, the Foreign Secretary, out. Ian Lang, the Trade Secretary, defeated. Michael Forsyth, the Scottish Secretary. William Rawlgrave, Treasury Secretary. And Norman Lamont, former Chancellor of the Exchequer, having a stab at Harrogate, defeated. David Mellor in Putney, out. Jonathan Aitken, a former Minister, out. Sir Marcus Fox, chairman of the Backbench 1922 Committee, defeated the man who would have organised the leadership uh, election if John Major stands down and the Social Security Minister Alistair Burt. And a win for Martin Bell in Tatton. As independent, we'll be hearing from him in a moment. Tony Blair, the Labour leader. 
The support that's been given to us tonight has been given so that we can build one country, one nation, one society. And John Major, the Prime Minister, tonight we've been comprehensively defeated. We'll listen to the voice of the electorate and reflect on it. Michael Portillo said, this is a truly terrible night for the Conservatives. I would have liked the chance to help rebuild the party. He being outside the House of Commons now and says he will do what he can from the wings. Kenneth Clark, Chancellor of the Exchequer, for us to fall into mutual recriminations would be folly. We've got to pick ourselves up and lose with dignity from a possible challenger for the leadership when that battle comes. And this is how the news came to us during the night. These are the highlights of a very dramatic turnaround in British politics, the most dramatic scenes we've seen certainly since the war. Stevenage, the Follets appear to be about to celebrate their victory there with a Grand Prix size bottle of champagne which won't open. Well, there we are. I think the thing to do is shake it and, and just see if the cork will pop out. No. There's going to be the most terrible explosion in a moment. This is the agony of celebrating victory in Stevenage. The most interesting photo opportunity of the entire election campaign. Ken Follett there, the very successful writer. I think it's time to listen to a chorus of things can only get better from the festival hall and leave them to their fate in Stevenage. They'd obviously be better off with orange juice. D. Ream playing the song that they played right through the campaign that drove people on the campaign bus mad. Just to say this is la <laughs> Labour's celebration while extra hands are brought in to Stevenage to try and open the court. We'll, we'll, keep you, we'll keep you abreast of Stevenage as the night goes on. They were called they were called champagne socialists, but they're clearly very incompetent champagne socialists. Perhaps they're not really champagne socialists at heart at all. The Follett family quite incapable of opening a bottle of champagne. We'll go back there during the evening as as as, as, it, as it, no, it's broken. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Right, Francine Francine Stock from the Royal Festival Hall. I hope the Labour Party there is being rather more successful. There have been no, no problems whatsoever in opening these champagne bottles here, and it's flowing 
very freely, as you can hear behind me, things have definitely warmed up since we had that set from Dream, and there's a lot of dancing, a lot of singing, actors and actresses, people in the world of entertainment, all sorts of people piling in, and now the first of the heavyweights from the former Shadow Cabinet, now part of the government itself, Robin Cook is with me. Good evening. Good evening. Robin Cook. No, nobody's going to call Ken and Barbara champagne socialists ever again after that performance. <laughs> you never in your wildest kind of projections would you have imagined a majority this large? No, I mean, I did get into trouble for saying the word landslide six weeks ago. I guess I can use that word safely now, but none of us ever imagined that it was going to be on this scale. And I was, I find myself both tremendously encouraged but moved by the trust which the British people have put in the new Labour Party. And we must now work hard to make sure we deliver on that trust. But no doubt about it, the biggest cheer of the evening here came when Mr Mortillo lost his seat. I mean, there's also, it is a rejection vote as much as an endorsement of you. Oh, I think what happened tonight is a reflection of three things. First of all, the tremendous leadership of Tony Blair, who has shown the world that he can lead the Labour Party, and Britain now wants that leadership in charge number 10. Secondly, Labour fought on the issues that affect the lives of the real people out there, health service, education, jobs. And thirdly, yes, the country looked at the Tory party, they saw a divided party with a weak leader, and they recognised that such a party is not fit for government. So, here you are with a much, much larger majority than expected. How is that going to affect the complexion of the future Labour government? Well, first of all, it is not going to affect the policies in which we fought this election, and in which the people have given us a mandate. As Tony Blair has said, we will deliver what we promise and we will repay the trust of British people by sticking to our word. Uh, as to the future, of course, it will be very valuable to us to have what I think anybody's going to recognise as a working majority. OK, thank you. And uh, we're back with us now. And, but is it surely not going to mean that you could be, can it, will it mean you could be more radical? More radical? Well, Tony Blair has already said that in government, we may be more radical than people think, but by that he meant that people had not fully grasped just how much our policies add up to. We are going to deliver a just society based on fairness. We are going to deliver an economy in which there's opportunity for the many, not privilege for the few. And we're going to deliver a renewed democracy which brings power back to the people. That's a radical package, but it is a radical package in which we fought this election. Robin Cook, thank you. Thank you. Back to you, Liv. They, they finally, just to keep you up to date with this big event in Stevenage, they finally found a corkscrew and rather perilously opened the champagne bottle with that and now they're celebrating the privilege of going back to the House of Commons with a huge majority, 423 seats we think Labour is going to have, a majority of 187, Barbara Follett there, celebrating. So, Peter, I'm very worried about this um, House of Commons. How is Labour going to fit on the government yeah. benches? Yeah, well, how as wise as I am, I, I hope we're going to get the doors open. Having watched that scene in Stevenage, I hope we're going to get the doors of the House of Commons open. So just hold your breath while I try for it. Yes, we're all right. Now then, these are the opposition benches over here, David, and we're going to see John Major on those opposition benches with our latest forecast at 163, the fewest Conservative MPs we've seen since the beginning of the 20th century. Here is the... Uh, Liberal Democrat score, Paddy Ashton, is going to have no fewer than 44 uh, MPs under his command there. 29 others, of course, including Martin Bell. There's the winning post coming up now, the 330 line you have to cross. And here comes uh, Tony Blair's Labour Party. Spinning along through the winning post, right the way past, with 423 MPs. Now, of course, they won't all fit on that side. Some of them have to come round and sit on the opposition benches. They won't fit on the government side, uh, all those 423. However, let's look at the majority you'll have anyway over the, all the opposition parties. There we are, 423 versus 236, a Labour majority of 187. Take you into Downing Street now and just look how that compares with previous records. Here we have our pictures on the stairs of former Prime Ministers. There's Clement Attlee back in uh, 1945 with a majority of 146. Labour Prime Minister with the biggest majority so far. There's Margaret Thatcher with the biggest Tory majority so far, 144 in 83. And now here we have Tony Blair with a majority forecast, at this moment anyway, forecast 187. So just look how he sits compared to his predecessors. The biggest majority since the war by any party. David.
Well, Peter, thanks very much. Robin Oakley, look, you sit there day in, day out, watching the House of Commons and, and seeing the Tory party and the acute difficulty it was, ending up with a majority of minus one. What happens when Labour goes in there with a majority of, what are we saying now, nearly 200, 187? Well, Labour will have their problems, of course. They're, for example, on pushing through their legislation on devolution, so many of their English MPs are not really interested in all of that. They will have their troubles on Europe, uh, just as the Conservatives ha have done, but not on anything like the same scale, because Europe on the Labour side, while there are some potential rebels on issues like the single currency, it doesn't have that same sort of gut quality that has upset the Tories so badly. They don't look on it, uh, the, the problems with Europe in the same way on, on a basis of sovereignty.